Warning, this story contains scenes and scenarios that may be disturbing to some viewers. Viewer discretion is advised. There was a blue tint across the city that embraced the dry, cold winds that caressed the entire place. Snow covered the city, the streets, the buildings, and the old, abandoned vehicles in a quiet realm. There was not a soul in sight, the place seemingly inhabited only by the sounds of winds brushing up against the surface now covered in ice. The sun was now setting on this hauntingly serene sight, just when the silence was finally broken by the sounds of a lone pair of footsteps in the thick, snow-covered terrain. A man, about forty years of age, dressed in a dark military camouflage covered by a thick fur coat that is more suited to feminine tastes, walked along the road. He wielded a small knife, military grade, as he slowly walked up to a black car left right around the corner of the street, resting under the shade of a tiny building, presumably a restaurant or a shop of sorts. Not that it mattered now in this cold hellscape. He crouched as he walked towards the car, as if trying to conceal the sounds of his movements, hiding them under the sounds of the blowing winds. A huge portion of his face was covered with a thick black cloth, presumably to keep his face warm, shielding him from the cold. Donovan. He heard his name whispered in the emptiness. The speaker's sex remained unknown to him. The whispering was too faint to be recognized, but loud enough to interpret. Donovan. He heard again. He was afraid, no. This was something he was not prepared for. A part of him believed that this was nothing but a trick of the mind, an auditory hallucination, and nothing more. But he knew the truth. This was real. Very real. His fear kept him from calling out to the whisper, or even looking around for the source. All he did was walk up to the car. He took a look inside the car through the open window. There was a man inside, a rather large man. He was very handsomely dressed, sitting still as his dark blood stained the white of his shirt. He was very obviously long dead, a pistol on his lap, gripped by his left hand while his mouth lay wide open. The blood stains behind him on the back seat pretty much told the story. It was an old stain. The cold had banished the blood to the leather seat covering and the glass windows. The city was dead, and with it, the fat millionaire in this car. Donovan reached for the man's pistol from the window and checked for bullets. It was almost full, just missing three shots. The rich man had taken up to defend himself from whatever plagued this city, but he had fallen into a sense of hopelessness and chose an easier fate from what he had witnessed others fall prey to. One to the head, one through the window. Donovan deduced. Whatever the man was shooting at, it terrified him. Enough so he'd rather swallow a bullet. Donovan. He heard this whisper once again. This time he jolted his head in alarm. In here. He looked towards the car window this time, and what he saw shocked him. So much so, he fell back on the ground in the snow, aiming his gun at the car. The dead man peered through the open window, only restrained by the seat belt, his jaw wide open into a hungry grin. The man's eyes widened, and his tongue stuck long out of his mouth like a snake. The man hissed at Donovan, just when he unloaded a shot into the thing's face, sending it back into the car. There was no blood. Donovan laid back, looking towards the sky, 
breathing heavily in relief as he did. Just when he heard the door slowly click open. It was dark. Night had brought with itself an eerie silence, only broken by an array of wheels of heavy vehicles driving down the road. Donovan sat in the back of the truck in his uniform, gripping his rifle with both hands and looking down the barrel. There were three others with him, all silence like him. There was something about this operation that had him feeling uneasy. You're the man. That's what his dad always told him whenever he felt fear. You're the man. The voice echoed in his head. His dad was long gone, but his voice still lingered in his head. And on this mission, he needed it. They weren't given much information about their mission, but all they knew was that this was more of a report what you see, as Donovan would have described it, than a search and rescue operation, as they have been told. Does anyone feel that? The soldier next to Donovan said. What the fuck's wrong with you all of a sudden, Maddie? The man opposite Matt asked. Uh, I don't know, man. Uh, there's something wrong. Seriously, wrong about this whole thing. Matt replied. The man replied to Matt. Well, yeah. Sending the damn army in the middle of a city. They won't even tell us what's wrong. So yeah, I feel you. The truck stopped moving. The soldiers were nervous. Everyone felt the tension in the tightly packed chamber they sat in. What the fuck? Is this it? The soldier opposite Matt sat. There was a bit of silence, but that was it. There were no sounds from the front of the truck. The other fleets also seemed to just stop, as nothing could be heard except the sounds of the wind and the breathing of the men in the truck. Hey, everyone all right in there? Donovan asked the driver. No reply. Fuck this, I'm out, Matt said as he stormed out the back of the truck. The men called out to him as he ran, to no avail. Donovan cursed under his breath before getting off the truck. Sit tight, I'm gonna go get him, he said before running after Matt, running on the ice, grasping his rifle tight. Donovan stopped when he realized that he had lost sight of Matt. He called out to Matt. He was only met with the silence of the night. The darkness didn't help much either. There were almost no lights here, except the lights from the truck. The moonlight seemed to be completely absent. Then, there was the sound of gunfire. Panicked screams and crashes could be heard. Donovan turned to rush to the truck, slipping down and falling face first into the snow. He moaned slightly and tried to stand up straight. As he did, a man got out from one of the trucks, pointing his gun, holding it in the left hand and clutching what seemed to be a grenade in his right. Donovan didn't know what to do when the man suddenly rushed towards him, except raising his gun at the man and firing at him. The explosive dropped, sending Donovan down onto the streets below the bridge he stood upon. His head spun as the world around him went to black. Time passed. Maybe an hour, but maybe a day. Donovan was on his feet again. He stumbled on the snow, embracing himself to gather some kind of body heat within to work against the piercing cold. He had but little memory of what happened for a while, but he walked on forward. There was nothing in this wasteland but a snow-covered city. No sounds, no people, nothing. Donovan walked on. Now the cold was really getting to him. Something was seriously wrong with this place. The cold was unnatural. The silence was unsettling, and the emptiness was eerie. Now walking for hours, he finally spotted something that made him feel some relief. A woman, or so it seems to be, lay on the ground, her back resting on the door of some kind of shop. 
he rushed to her, gathering all of his remaining strength to power through the cold. Ma'am, he called out to her. Are you alright? She remained uncomfortably still. It's alright, ma'am. I... Donovan knew the obvious all along, but was in denial until she was just a few feet from him. She had been deceased a long while. Her body was frozen in the cold. He wasn't really shocked when he saw this. In a way, he hadn't fully accepted the situation he was in. He took her coat after he checked for any signs of life to keep himself warm. As ashamed a man like him would be to admit, he was thankful for the coat he found on this woman. Had she not been lying lifeless here, he probably would have been instead. He walked on, putting his hands into the coat's pocket to warm them, when he found something. A black scarf. It was a lucky find for Donovan. Then he heard something, like the snow shifting behind him. He turned to see the woman's corpse, now lying sideways. Her peacefully resting eyes, now wide open and staring right at him. Donovan wanted to call out to her, but something in his gut told him to keep walking, which he had learned to listen to over the years. In the night, he found a tiny shelter for himself in what seems to be an old Chinese restaurant. He locked himself in the bathroom, clutching the pistol he had found earlier today in the rich man's car. He lay, thinking about it. It had been a terrifying encounter, but whatever that man had become, it was clearly no human. Donovan saw the door open as the man dropped out on all fours like some sort of rabid beast and let out a growl, his face still into this maddening grin as he did. His long tongue seemed to taste the air itself while his mouth drooled. Donovan opened fire at the thing, unloading the entire round into its face, standing up only when the beast was down for sure. Even then it showed signs of movement, and Donovan ran. Ran until his lungs felt like they would collapse and heart beat like it would burst. Even in this murderous cold, he felt his body heat up. Now he lay here in the night, the memory of the encounter keeping him up in the tight bathroom space he found himself in. Hopefully, he will find a way out of this soon. The morning light came, but that wasn't what woke him up. It was the sound of gunshots. There was someone out there. Donovan walked out of his small hiding place and into the snow, clutching his knife and pistol as he did. There in the distance were two silhouettes of what seems to be a man and a woman. Hey, the woman said to him. Donovan stood still, not knowing what to do. He did remember one of those things whispering to him, so he wasn't sure if these were real people he saw. The man then shouted out to him, Prove that you're human. Donovan stood in silence for a while, thinking of what he should do. He decided that the appropriate thing would be to answer back and test those two in the distance. He had the question clear in his mind, and the words came to his lips as he spoke out as loud as his condition allowed him to speak in. What? There was a gunshot right at Donovan as he fell on the snow. His blood sprinkled on the white surface as he looked up at the sky, coughing and struggling to stay awake. He felt weak, and the pain stung. Was it his end? He wasn't sure but he would rather die from a bullet rather than from what that thing he encountered yesterday was. That he was sure of. He felt himself fading as his weakness slowly overcame him, and the world turns to black. He woke up a while later in a warehouse, bound to a seat by a thick rope. He could easily wriggle out of this mess of a knot but he felt too weak to. 
a woman, the one who had presumed shot him, judging by the same coat she wore, was examining his wound, oblivious to the fact that he was conscious again. The Donovan let out a little grunt. The woman, startled, moved back a little. A man got into the room, and she reached up to him hurriedly. He pointed a gun at Donovan. Donovan looked up. Now his mind was clear as day, as he could make out the faces of the both of them. The woman was rather at an average height, around 5'6", wearing a coat as she had when he was shot, unarmed, and blue eyes wide open, staring in fear. She bit her lower lip, which was chapped in this cold. Her blonde hair flowed down to her shoulders in a tangled mess. She was a younger woman, a girl, perhaps his daughter. She was definitely around 18 or 20, Donovan guessed. The man was 5'11", wearing a Christmas sweater underneath a thick coat, the collar of his pink shirt peeking through the neck of his sweater. He wore glasses over his brown eyes. His hair was dark and so was his mustache. Not a very grand or magnificent style, but rather a simple, generic style, though unkempt. He was most definitely not a fierce warrior, judging by his somewhat bulging love handles and shapeless figure. Not overweight in the slightest, but rather a simple, so-called dad bod. He was noticeably shaking as he pointed his gun at Donovan. Donovan waited for the man to say something. There was nothing but this awkward standoff. The man was about to speak, but Donovan spoke out. What's happening out there? The man replied to him in a low voice. You... you're human, aren't you? Donovan coughed. Yeah, what kind of question is that? The man replied. Out there... There are things, and we don't know what's happening. We can't risk you being one of them. I'm sorry. There was silence after that. God damn it. Just at least try to convince me that you're human. Don't be quiet. The man clenched his fists and then covered his face with his palm as the young woman took the gun from him. She walked over to Donovan and observed his wound. He stared right back at her. She pressed her thumb into his wound and Donovan's soul tore apart. He screamed in agony as he felt the string move up his hip. She let him go and walked back, still pointing the gun at him. He tumbled on the floor and a puddle of spittle formed around his face, originating from his mouth. He kept on screaming, struggling to get out of these ropes as he did. She immediately got to him and cut open the ropes, removing them from him. He feels pain, I guess, and he bled as well. He hasn't turned. She told the man. Turned? She squatted down and looked him in the face. You're all right. It's okay. Donovan stood up, steadying himself as he slowly did. The woman moved back a little. Jesus Christ, I'm not a... zombie. The woman laughed a bit. I can help you. I'm from the army. We were attacked. I don't know what's going on here, but I do know that we aren't safe here. We need to leave this city ASAP. Donovan said with his back straightening and chest protruding. The woman offered her hand, and Donovan shook it. My name's Kristen. Uh, Kristen Gilligan. And that's Mr. Rosen. Donovan Black. Well, Donovan Black, we sure as hell won't be going anywhere tonight. She said it so calmly. Donovan felt unsettled. Why? Those things out there, their numbers increase at night. I don't know where they come from. Mr. Donovan lowered his gun. Donovan looked over at him and motioned for him to pass the gun over to him. In a clumsy motion, Mr. Rosen turned the gun and dropped it, 
jumping back in slight startlement. Donovan picked the gun up and examined it. It was a pistol. A twenty-two. You're not very good at this, are you? Donovan asked Mr. Rosen. Mr. Rosen replied with a shrug. Too heavy for me. Uh, Kristen here was teaching me how to use one of those when, uh, when you got hurt. I never wanted anything to do with violence and guns. They never teach you how to use one of those during math. You a professor? High school teacher. Not that it matters now. He said it with some embarrassment, looking at the floor and laughing slightly as he adjusted his glasses. There was a moment of silence, which was broken by Kristen. So, what's the plan, military man? There have to be more survivors. We have to get them and take them with us, Donovan declared. Obviously, not tonight, Kristen chimed in. Donovan nodded in reply. Suddenly, there was a thud and a crash as a window cracked and something came in. Mr. Rosen stepped back from the window, his hand on his chest, and Kristen patted herself, looking frantically for a weapon. Donovan walked up ahead of both of them, making himself a barrier of defense against whatever malevolent force had broken through. It appeared to be a man. He was on the floor, convulsing as the broken shards of glass pierced through him. His limbs twisted and turned, and so did his head. His skin grew scaly, and his expression was that of intense sadness, almost forming tears, which ran down the forehead of his twisted head. Like some foul canine, he barked in an eerie human voice and began to run at them. Donovan fired. One shot, two shots, and then three. The thing finally fell and stopped. What the fuck? Donovan murmured to himself, still pointing his gun at the twitching thing. A roar rang out from outside, loud enough to shake all the glass windows still intact. Oh no, Kristen said. Mr. Rosen started to pray, his voice shaking in fear. There was a gigantic, bald, humanoid being with eyes like that of a spider that walked towards them. Donovan could see through the windows. It was muscular and wore a belt lined with something Donovan couldn't make out clearly. Mr. Rosen could. He fainted at the sight of the human heads dangling from the thing's belt as it made its way to them. Donovan didn't know what to do. In a rush, he looked around. His heart was pounding at his chest. He picked Mr. Rosen up on his shoulder. He was a slightly heavier man, but Donovan was strong. His hip hurt, but there was no time to complain. Come on! He shouted out to Kristen to follow. She walked over to the now deceased creature with three bullets in it and picked it up. What the fuck are you doing? Donovan screamed at her saw this in a show. She ran with him out the door and away from the approaching thing. It noticed them running and followed them, now running to them. She was slowed down by the weight of the thing she carried. Donovan noticed the dinosaur of a being getting closer and closer. It roared as it closed the distance. Drop it, Kristen. Donovan didn't have to yell twice. She did as he said, and dropped it. The giant stopped to examine the twisted corpse, and then bent down, and started to consume it fiercely. Kristen was getting exhausted, running behind Donovan, and he noticed, slowing his pace, also getting tired. Donovan broke open the window of a building and placed Mr. Rosen carefully on the floor, clear of the broken glass. He motioned Kristen to come over and hand her the gun. Take this. I'll be back soon. I promise. Don't go anywhere. She had not had anything in her to reply with, so she automatically complied. He walked to the giant, still feasting on the body, 
and stopped just a few feet from it. The monster noticed and lifted its head. The face was so ugly, almost like it was burned by acid. The eyes shone black like a spider as a thin pink strip, which Donovan could only assume was its tongue cleaning the flesh off its spider-like jaws. The being tackled Donovan onto the icy terrain, screeching a horrid sound as it did, and flexed its two fangs to crush his skull. Donovan reached for the knife in his pocket and tore apart the jaws from the middle. He then raised his pistol and shot it. The inside of his skull emptied through. He lay in the snow, the blood of the being wrapped around his blade still in his hand. He looked up at the sky and now laughed hysterically. Standing up, he looked at the monstrosity on the ice and put another shot in the thing before turning back and walking to the shop where he left his fellow survivors. He quietly said to himself as he did, I'm the man. My name is Donovan Black. The time is currently 530 hours or 530 AM. The sun should have been rising right about now, but it's still dark out there. We will be vacating this place and hopefully looking for a new shelter. They know we are here now, and they will definitely get to us if we stay here much longer. God has looked away, but we can still find hope. We cannot get the radio to work. This is the last resort. If you find this, we will be at the bridge every evening before sunsets every day. Find us. We will be stronger together, I promise you. Still have hope. Sergeant Black, over and out. The clouds are still covering up all the sunlight. There might be a storm coming our way. Kristen closed and pulled her fingers from the blinds and turned to Donovan. He was obviously disappointed with this information she gave him, but he knew that there was nothing he could do about it. Now still go. We can't take any chances. If I may say something. Mr. Rosen stood up, still wearing the same ugly Christmas sweater underneath, looking almost the same as he had been when Donovan had first met him the only change being a slight crack in his glasses. We should move on. We can't stay here much longer, Donovan. All we have left are those crackers. Just crackers, for God's sake. Mr. Rosen said it with a lower voice, as always, his jaw hanging open and his eyes looking at Donovan as if to appeal to him. I agree. Kristen nodded her head in agreement. Donovan was in a troubling situation now. He realized that this was the most sensible thing he could do. They had to move on. The demons would find them soon, he was sure. Maybe all they could last was a few more days, two at most, before they are discovered. But before that, they will run out of food and water for sure. They had to look for a new place before that, but that would mean heading further away from the bridge making the way to the bridge much more dangerous. No. He spoke his mind. Not willingly, but it came off of his mouth just like that. Mr. Rosen took a seat. Jesus, Donnie. Are you trying to get us killed with everyone else? Mr. Rosen finally spoke up, this time slightly louder than he had ever been before. It's been a long time, Donnie. The sun hasn't come up for days now. You can't expect us to go on like this. Kristen said again. This time, her hand was on his shoulder, as if an attempt to appeal to his rationality over his sense of duty. One last time, Mr. Rosen told Donovan. Just one last time, then we go. Donovan seems to agree to this, however reluctant he was. He would have waited longer, but now these people were his responsibility, or so he felt. 
It was still dark, but Donovan didn't care much. This was the last time he would check for survivors at the bridge. Then, as promised, they leave. He had a bag slung around his left shoulder. His pistol, and that prized a knife that saved him from certain death a few days back, was tucked in his belt to his convenience. He had ditched the heavy uniform. There was no point in carrying one anymore. Instead, wearing a long black fur coat he had found in the previous house they had occupied, ditching the old feminine one. He looked like some kind of bear in this cold hell. Kristen packed everything. She was sure they were to leave, and even though she had hoped that they would find somebody here, she was not feeling particularly optimistic here. She was dressed the same as she had been dressed all the while. Mr. Rosen was the slowest. This was a man who had never been in a single fight in his life. He was an aging man as well. Not the kind built to endure such extremity, but here he was, together with two capable people in this cursed world. He was still governed by the same principles as he did in his teaching days. A man of education, not a brute. He could not find it in himself to even lift a gun. The bridge was deserted, as Donovan had expected, even though he hoped for the alternative. There was the broken end of the bridge, crumbled to the grounds below, where his truck had crashed, where Donovan had died in the real world and awoken in hell. There's no one here, said Kristen, blowing a puff of condensation through her mouth. We wait, if there are any survivors, and if this is the last time we will check for any, we wait, Donovan said, finding himself a seat on the wreckage. Mr. Rosen hadn't had it in himself to argue. He was at the mercy of this man and the least he could do was sit quietly and comply. Kristen unwillingly complied as well, seeing the majority agree with this decision. Mr. Rosen walked towards the wreckage, as he always did when they came around to wait for anyone who found their message. He bent down to the ruins of a car and sat in the passenger seat, knowing that he could rest here while they waited. An hour passed by relatively quickly, as compared to the hours to come. They dragged on and on until the sun was beginning to go down. Mr. Rosen and Kristen were both asleep, with only Donovan now keeping watch. Fuck it, he said to himself. He grabbed the microphone in his bag and started to set it up with a speaker to record another message. He had left about three or four of these already, but nothing came of it but Donovan was in no mood to admit defeat just yet. He set it up and was about to record one last message. This was his last recorder. But just before he could, he saw something in the distance. There was motion. Someone was coming his way. Excitement came over him as he swung his arms in the air and gritted his teeth. Uh, hey! hey. He spoke out to Kristen and Mr. Roger, startling awake the both of them. They could see where he was looking, a huge smile on his face as he did. There was a group of people heading towards the bridge. Get up here, Donovan called out to them, but they paid no mind and kept walking and walking. He was a bit confused by this. They weren't attempting to climb towards the bridge, but rather under it. Then it hit him, the sudden horror of the mistake he had made in his excitement. Fuck, Kristen murmured as the things got closer, and Donovan could see why they were walking so slowly. It was not a group of people, it was something else entirely. An insect-like being made up of people with their limbs and skin attached to one another, so from a distance it seemed as if it was a tiny horde. It looked up from under the bridge at them, standing in the middle of the wreckage. Get up here! It screeched in Donovan's voice, the exact same tone and pitch. 
Jesus, please save my children. Fuck, no, Sarah, run. It spoke out in multiple voices, lifeless voices, imitating them. To this thing, it was just a sound without meaning or any emotions. It, like an emotion of licking its lips, let out a long, flat mass of flesh and caressed the bodies of men, women, and children wrapped around it. Slowly and steadily, Donovan backed away from the thing, making minimal noise, motioning both Kristen and Mr. Rosen to follow. The thing had fled. It had formed some sort of mutual understanding with Donovan, as if to say, I do not hunger, but I will feed on all and any that lurk in my territory. And even though Donovan hated that being, that foul, cursed thing, He respected that. He knew fear better than he ever had. And so did Kristen and Mr. Rosen, judging by their faces. They proceeded to walk away from the bridge, slowly, as to not startle or spook the thing to attack them. Kristen knew in her gut that she must keep going, but there was a certain tingle in her, a tingle that told her to turn back and have one more look, which she did and to her horror, discovered the thing dangling from a web of muscle and flesh, upside down on the bridge, like a fucked up spider. She raised her hand up to her mouth and fell on her knees to gag. Mr. Rosen held her shoulders and patted them as she wept out of both disgust and fear. This was all too much to bear. In the empty city, Donovan unleashed himself. Fuck! He was enraged as well as guilty. He kept on kicking the hanging door of an old car out of pure spite, and then fell on the snow when his legs got stuck. This enraged him even more, and he stood up and continued hitting the car, falling once again. Mr. Rosen knew well not to interfere, and especially after what he had just witnessed and realized, he wasn't in the best state of his mind, while Kristen lay on the ice, crying. After his third fall, the emotions Donovan felt overwhelmed him so much, he sat on the snow, and straight up started crying. I killed them. Oh, oh God, I let them into a fucking trap. Mr. Rosen watched this man break down in front of him. He wanted to do something, help him, but he felt very powerless, especially watching a man he considered to be stronger than him fall apart like this. Oh God, oh God. Donovan began to puke into the snow and then continued to cry. Mr. Rosen tried to think about why he wasn't as affected as these two. Was he a monster? Where had this all been too much for his mind to accept yet? He looked around to stop his chain of thoughts, just when he noticed a sign that comforted him a little. He walked towards a broken Donovan and sat down on the ground next to him. It's okay, son. This isn't your fault. Donovan buried his head into Mr. Rosen's shoulder and continued weeping. Forgive, forgive me, forgive me, God. He whimpered as Mr. Rosen gave him a reassuring pat on the back and stood him up slowly and steadily. He walked with Donovan towards Kristen and held her hand. Come. He escorted both of these broken souls to the bar he saw in the distance, carefully inspecting the inside first, then entering, sitting them both down on two seats, and then shutting the door behind him, turning the closed sign around and officially opening the bar back for business. He took Donovan's pistol from his belt, and Kristen's as well, and set them on the table. He then proceeded to mix a few drinks for the both of them. 
No. In my day, we used to have ourselves a little of this. He grabbed himself a bottle of whiskey from the top shelf of the bar and set it on the table. He felt a sudden urge to go to the bathroom. He cursed himself for it. He didn't want to leave these two alone. But then the idea of him watching over them sounded very ridiculous to him. So he didn't care and went on anyway. As he took Donovan's gun and stuffed it in his pocket so that he couldn't hurt himself with it. He had seen students self-harm before in math tests, and he didn't want this to happen to Donovan. He also decided to take Kristen's gun with him and went about his business. Five minutes, tops, he assured himself. The door rolled open, and before Mr. Rosen realized, there was already another presence in the bar. Oblivious, he remained in the bathroom quickly washing his hands with the freezing water and rushing back out to be greeted by something very unexpected. There were three men in the room. Yes, he thought. Men. One of them wore a straight jacket, the likes of which were unknown to him, with a bald head and half a tattooed face. He had a gun in his right hand, and not a pistol like him but a huge gun. He didn't know what those were called, but he stuck to rifle. The other man wore a simple coat, obvious he was cold from the wind, wearing a baseball cap. He also had a rifle pointed straight at Mr. Rosen. Then there was the third, not exactly a man, but what appeared to be a boy, a very young boy. He wore a hat along with a black coat, holding a pistol trained at Mr. Rosen. Nervously, Mr. Rosen scanned the room for Donovan and Kristen to find them still on their seats, with their hands down at the sight of the pointed guns. It's okay. Relax. We don't want any trouble. Mr. Rosen nervously spurted out to the tattooed man, whom he presumes to be in charge. Shut the fuck up! You, put your gun on the table! Mr. Rosen stood still, not fully grasping the situation he was in. Fucking do it, the man said, now aiming his rifle more tightly at Mr. Rosen. All right, all right, son, just don't fire. Mr. Rosen set a gun up on the table, Kristen's gun, keeping Donovan's gun still in his pocket. He was nervous. If this man knew that he was still armed, there was a pretty good chance he would end up dead in the ice. What's your name? The man with the baseball cap asked. Harold Rosen. The tattooed man looked at him. Did I fucking ask you to do anything? The man in the baseball cap was slightly nervous. Don't talk to my dad like that. Shut the fuck up, kid. The tattooed man replied to the child. Put the gun down, Mike. The man with the baseball cap told the tattooed man. Mike held the gun on Mr. Rosen for a moment, convinced that he would pull the trigger. Mr. Rosen reached for the gun in his pocket, trying to remember all the things about guns that Kristen had taught him. Fuck. Mike sighed and let his gun down. Mike walked over to Kristen and started searching her, rubbing his hands suggestively over her body making her uncomfortable. Mr. Rosen was uncomfortable as well and was about to speak out before Mike started searching for Donovan. Donovan took this opportunity and pinned him down on the floor. Relax, relax, be cool. Donovan whispered to a frantic Mike who was struggling to free himself. Mr. Rosen saw the man with the baseball cap pointing his gun at Donovan on the floor and watching this, he pointed his own gun at the man. Point the gun elsewhere, or I'll pull this trigger. Mr. Rosen wasn't shaking now. The gun in his hand, pointed at the assailant, made him feel powerful. Kristen took the opportunity to point her gun at the man as well. Donovan grabbed his knife and pressed it down on Mike's throat, just enough to push it down, but not cut through. Then, all of a sudden, everything was calm. I kid you not, I'll fucking kill you. 
Donovan told Mike. The man with the baseball cap looked down, unable to move due to the two guns trained at him. Fucking shoot him, Frank, Mike told the man with the cap. Donovan punched Mike in the face, sending a drop of blood running down his lip. Look, we might be the only survivors left here, and we're here fighting like a bunch of fucking animals. Frank spoke out loud. His son was a little amazed to hear his dad cuss, even though his dad did it more frequently than ever before. Though still shaking with the gun pointed at Kristen, and then Mr. Rosen, and back to Kristen again. He honestly didn't care for the scumbag, Mike. Look, Frank said as he dropped his rifle, a sign of mutual understanding. We go our own ways. There doesn't need to be any bloodshed, Frank said again. Yeah, Donovan said. There was madness in his eyes. He almost enjoyed hurting this man he had pinned on the ground. Promise me. Promise me that you'll be nice, Donovan said to Mike. Yeah, I promise. He let Mike go and stood up. Mike reached for his gun, but realized that the guns were now outmatched. He simply raised his hands. Frank, listen to me. You three wouldn't make it by yourselves, and neither will us. We have a better chance if we stand together, Donovan told him. Frank thought for a moment. How can I trust you? Frank asked Donovan. My name's Donovan. This is Kristen and Mr. Rosen. He told Frank as calmly as he could. Donovan, I don't know if I can trust you. I'm really sorry, but we gotta leave. But you do trust Mike. Well, don't you? Donovan replied to Frank. There was a moment of silence. Frank was about to speak when they heard something in the snow. Frank pulled out a small candle from his back pocket. What? Mr. Rosen was about to ask. Shh, shh. Frank told him to be quiet as he lit the candle with a box of matches in his pocket. The candlelight burned for a moment. The whole room just quietly stared at the still flame, which then suddenly turned red and sparked up like a dynamite stick, then blew itself out. Fucking hell, Frank cussed. Lock the doors, now. Donovan didn't need to ask. He trusted this man. Donovan, along with Mr. Rosen, Mike, Frank, and Kristen, ran around looking for all entrances and locking them up while Frank's son proceeded to shut the windows in the front, blocking them with whatever he could get his hands on. The back door was the last door to be shut, then Frank commanded everyone to move to the front. You mind telling us what the hell's going on? Donovan asked Frank, but he already knew somehow. He felt it. Flames are strange when those things are around. Judging by the way this flame jumped, I'd say there's a lot of them. Probably a swarm. Fuck. Frank was definitely worried. His son ran up to him and sat next to his father. Dad, Mom's still up there. We have to go get her. We might have to wait this one out, Jim. The man kept cussing under his breath, his back to the front door, facing the back, while Mike covered the front. Wait, what? Donovan asked. His mother and the others, they're up there in the theater. Shit, we should have been together. They aren't safe up there. Frank said it out loud, distressing his son. Dad, no, I'll go get him, please. Jimmy was adamant. He could not accept the fact that his mother was back there, surrounded by strange monsters. Jimmy, please don't do this now, Mike said. He looked at Donovan. Look, man, I'm sorry about what happened. But let bygones be bygones. We watch each other's back, yeah? Mike said to him. Donovan heard him, but looked at Frank. We could all move to the theater, can't we? Frank gave Donovan a look as if to say, It's useless. Just don't give my son hope. Frank held his son 
as his son struggled to get free of his hold. Fuck it. I'll go get him. Donovan said out loud. Frank stood up. It's open from all sides. There's no way those things haven't gotten into the theater yet. Mike said. Let's take a chance. I'm willing if he is. Kristen said as she turns to face Frank. Everyone waited for Frank to speak. Yes, we'll go. Frank looked over everyone in the group. Jim, you stay here with Mike, Frank said as he walked to the door. No, you stay here and look after your boy, Frank. I'll take Mike, Donovan said. Yeah. Mike didn't argue. Frank just quietly nodded. I'll go too, Kristen chimed in. Kristen, Mr. Rosen said. What? She replied, a bit of anger in her voice. We need to be here. Someone has to defend this place as well. Please listen to me this once. He pleaded. She angrily tossed her gun to Donovan, who strapped it to his belt. No words were exchanged. Donovan nodded to the four people within the bar quietly, and then looked at Mike. You ready? Mike asked him. Donovan smirked a little, then threw the door open with all his force, and kicked it shut as quickly, with Frank and Kristen rushing to keep it closed. Meanwhile, the candle was in Jim's hands, who proceeded to light a match with his own matchbox and light it. The flame was a deep blood red now, and it flared higher than before, bursting into a huge spark, startling Jim, who dropped the candle, which seemed to pour hell out of the lit end now. Frank took notice and picked it up. He hadn't seen anything like this before. He looked over at Kristen and Rosen, who realized what had just happened. God help them. It had been a good minute, Donovan estimated, since Mike disappeared from his sight. He couldn't call out for him, in fear of being heard by the terrible things in the black mist lurking around him. He was pretty sure he was surrounded. The way the candle reacted and what Frankie had told him still danced in his head like some form of grotesque festival. He felt damned in this hell. And now, his head tore apart into two entities. Look for him and take him with you, or he'll die here, said one of them, the more compassionate side of Donovan. Let him be. He's fucked anyway. Get the others from the theater. You made a promise, Donovan. Do not forget it, said another, slightly colder part of him. A voice in him also suggested that he abandon the whole thing and save himself from certain death. But to Donovan's great relief... It was a very faint one. There was a swish somewhere, and Donovan turned around to face the sound. The mist was ever-growing, and even though it looked like smoke, Donovan never felt himself choke on it. There was just the slightest smell of something in the air. A smell Donovan could easily recognize, though he didn't know how. It didn't make sense, but denying it was his natural response a way to shield himself from the utter madness of such an idea. What he smelt was fear. Fear and pain. He froze in place as he saw a silhouette approaching, a humanoid figure with something in its right hand. Mike, Donovan let out a whisper. Yes, it was Mike. He could see Mike walk through the mist towards him, eyes red with slight moisture emanating from his tear ducts and his usually tan skin a very pale color, holding his pistol loosely in his hand. Mike, are you okay? Donovan asked once again to this person that stood in front of him, only a foot apart, maybe less. Fuck it, thought Donovan. He couldn't take any chances. He raised his gun at Mike, or rather, what used to be Mike. Don't tell me you don't smell all that. Donovan lowered his gun. 
I think it's making me sick, man. Come on. We'll get this over with quickly, and then leave this fucking place. Donovan placed his arm on Mike's shoulder, and they both sped along the way, Mike pointing the way to the theater. As they moved, Donovan could swear there was something much worse about this. He felt it, even through all these other insanities assaulting his senses. But it was made much worse by Mike confirming his suspicions. I think... I feel like something's watching us. Frank was busy, packing every supply he could gather in the bar, with the help of Kristen and Mr. Rosen. His son kept watch outside from the front window to look for anything other than the black mist. Something much worse was out there than anything they had encountered before, and he felt it. The candle flame was much stronger than he had ever seen. This worried him, thinking of his mother trapped up in the theater along with the other members of his group. He was not feeling very optimistic, but the way he denied the other outcomes made him feel much worse. It wasn't, after all, like those games and TV shows where you could put down zombies with a precise aim to the head. These things, however, whatever was out there, it was something else entirely. His chain of thought was interrupted by his father calling out to him. Jim, be on guard. This place might not be as safe as we thought. Jim just nodded his head in response. Mr. Rosen was unarmed. He wasn't used to the feeling of a gun. And even though this was no time to care for such a thing, there was simply not enough weapons lying around for him to carry one. So, when Kristen retrieved what appeared to be a medium-sized blade from somewhere in the bar, he was very thankful. At least now, he didn't feel naked, so to speak. Kristen held on to her pistol, making sure that it was full. There weren't many bullets left, and she knew that the pistol wouldn't do her much good out here, even with unlimited ammunition. A full round made her feel safer. Frank was assuming leadership here, considering that he may be the most experienced with a gun here. Working at a pawn shop and occasional visits to the shooting range made him feel like a dog amongst sheep here, but not in a demeaning way. They all gathered together in an imperfect circle formation, with everyone attentive towards what Frank had to say. I have a very bad feeling about this place. Whatever's out there is bad, and we all know it. We may not be safe bundled up in this place, but I'm not willing to take any chances out there either, so when... He corrected himself to speak again, forming a sentence in his mind so as to not sound very ominous. If, if something happens, we walk out through the front. Kristen agreed with him. She knew that this was the only choice they had. Unfortunately, Mr. Rosen did not share the reasoning of Kristen. Why take any chances at all? I think we would be much better off if we move now. If something happens at the wrong moment, we have a much greater risk separating ourselves from the others, do we not? He wasn't wrong, either. Frank did not want to agree with him here. Even though he was right, they were much better off separating than dying a horrible death. Uh, Harold, we can't take any chances out there. You saw the candle, and so did I. But going out there should be our last. Frank tried to reason with him, but Mr. Rosen interrupted his speech. Yes, I know what you're trying to tell me. But we do stand a better chance of making it out alive if we are together. If we are separated from Donovan and the others, how long do you think we'll last? Have you seen what's out there, Frank? Have you? I'll tell you what. A few hours ago, I saw what one of those things did to people, and I do not want any of us to end up like that. Calm down, Harold. Don't fucking tell me to calm down. Mr. Rosen said loudly, his voice startled Frank and Kristen equally, also frightening Jim a little. That was the first time Kristen heard him cuss, and that too, in such a loud tone. She felt as if this wasn't the same man she once knew as Harold Rosen, or was this the real Mr. Rosen all along? She didn't know. 
Mr. Rosen. She softly called out to him. Calm down, please. We will all make it out of here, alive and well. Donnie will bring back everyone, and we will leave, together. Nothing will happen. Everything will be okay. She wasn't reassuring him as much as herself. Okay? She asked, hoping that hearing him say it would make her feel much better. Okay. He raised his glasses to rub his eyes. I'm sorry. Sincerity was there somewhere in his voice, but neither Frank nor Kristen could tell to whom this apology was directed to. There was a sudden unease that came upon the room when Mr. Rosen finished his short apology as the entire place was filled with an unsettling silence. Frank raised a finger in the air to signal everyone to stay still. There was not a single sound except their own cold breaths. Jim could hear his own heartbeat, gripping the weapon tighter. He prayed in his head, harder than ever, but it seemed to be a futile effort. God had looked away. Frank slowly raised the back of his palm and called everyone towards him. Slowly, Kristen crept towards him, not making a single sound except for one deafening creak on the floor, followed by Jimmy, and then lastly, Mr. Rosen. They all had their eyes fixated on the front window ahead. Nothing but a black mist. Frank reached for his pocket, then pulled out a flashlight, and steadily pointed into the window. Jesus Christ, Frank muttered out. Kristen covered her mouth with her hand in terror. Jim stood frozen, and Mr. Rosen cringed in fear. There was, what appeared to be, a crowd of people looking in through the window at them. They all chattered their teeth as they stared. Their skin seemed normal, but there was something unsettlingly less about it. Their eyes were all black as they continued chattering. Some of them had their teeth bleeding, or lips missing, or an eye or ear. Whatever they were, they were all around the bar. They followed the smell of life. So fresh, so afraid. They were here to feed. That much was pretty apparent by the way the ones closest to the window drooled at the sight of them. Mr. Rosen looked around the room, hoping to find a way out, but he knew that all exits were impossible. Those things were all around them. Frank pointed his gun at the front door. His boy followed suits and started Kristen. Mr. Rosen looked up at the ceiling and closed his eyes in some sense of relief. I have an idea. The theater had a huge sliding glass door, shattered. That was a bad sign, especially since most of the shattered glass had impacted inwards. Something had broken in, or tried to. Donovan hoped they weren't too late. The men entered the building and ran up the spiral staircase. Donovan followed Mike's lead as he stepped on the first floor and ran towards a brightly lit hallway, passing multiple halls as they did finally stopping at hall number six. The gate was shut, not locked. This could mean anything. The men looked at each other and nodded. Whatever was through that door, they had to be ready for it. Donovan slowly opened the door as quietly as possible and snuck in the dark hall. Tara, Mike whispered slowly, hoping to catch the attention of his daughter. Tara! Hey! There was no response. Both of them were met with silence. Julia, Amber, Ross. No response. This was probably deserted, or these people had suffered a horrific fate. Fuck! Mike said out in a hushed tone. Donovan put his index finger up to his lips to silence Mike. Mike nodded in obedience 
but there was something odd now. Specifically, the way Donovan looked at Mike. Mike didn't move, and neither did Donovan, as he continued staring into Mike's eyes. Mike then noticed the subtle motion of Donovan's eyes. There was something behind him. Mike placed his hand on the trigger of the rifle and slowly turned behind, ready to fire, but held it when he saw a man slowly stumble towards them. Ross, Mike called out. The man stumbled towards them faster and faster. Mike raised his gun and fired out of panic. Donovan rushed to inspect the body, as did Mike. The body had been shot in the chest, yet it seemed to have already been dead a long time ago. The skin was pale and the eyes were dark black, open and staring at something, or at one of them. They couldn't tell. The thing did not move, but its teeth chattered as a black liquid ran down the corners of its lips. Oh, Jesus. Mike let it out. He was disgusted as much as he was disturbed at this sight, and he pointed his rifle at the thing's head to put it out of whatever pain it was in. No, wait, Donovan said. I want to see something. He didn't know why he wanted to do it. Morbid curiosity, maybe. Or just a presumption that he wanted to confirm. He placed his two fingers on the cold and dry cheeks of the chattering thing and squeezed a bit to open its mouth. He felt nothing at all as he witnessed this horrific sight, rather just slightly satisfied that his presumption was correct. There was no tongue. The only part that remained was what wasn't chewed off by the chatter. Mike cringed at the thought of it as he saw what Donovan saw. I'm sorry, Donovan said, as he placed the gun on the forehead of the thing and pulled the trigger. The head remained as it was, the only new addition being a black hole not bleeding like he had expected, seeing that the corners of its lips did leak something. Hey, man, we still have to go find them. Donovan stood up his eyes still fixated on the self-harming monster on the theater floor, lifeless and bloodless. Yeah, I suppose we do, he said slowly, his eyes still captivated by the brutal sight. Mike walked out, leaving him in there for a few seconds, after which he walked behind him, shutting the door as he did. Mike shouted the names through the stairway, upwards as well as downwards, to nothing. Where the hell did everyone go? Did they leave? Mike was obviously distressed. No matter what kind of a person he wanted the people around him to believe he was, he still had a heart, and not a one made of stainless steel, either. The thought of losing these people made him anxious, and he frantically ran up the stairs to look for them, Donovan running to catch up with him. They had now reached the third floor, above which there was the roof, which none of them knew how to access. Mike looked at Donovan for something, anything that would help, but he got nothing. Donovan then had a moment of genius and decided to try out an idea. How many bullets do you have left? He asked Mike. Don't know. There are some back at the bar with Frank. Good. Give me that. Grab this. Donovan tossed his pistol to Mike, taking his rifle. Then he proceeded to fire all around him, shattering glass cases and lights, overall causing a hellish ruckus. Mike covered his ears to shield them from the violation of this noise. Donovan had a slightly smug look on his face. He exchanged weapons with Mike again. Be ready. They're coming. Donovan said, and ran behind the food counter. Mike had no time to think about what just happened, so he decided to just follow Donovan's lead. From the hallway in front of them, the monsters streamed out in a swarm, stumbling their way across the room like some kind of drunken mob. They walked across the room, looking for the sources of the noise. Their chattering was so loud, Mike and Donovan both felt it. 
Donovan looked at Mike from behind the computer. He held up five fingers to Mike, who was confused at first, but then understood what was going on when the five became four and the four became three. As Donovan raised the final finger, he jumped from the counter and ran towards the hallway in front and made a run for it. The smell of fear and pain still in the air, fresh as these chattering creatures had been haunting these halls. It seemed to make a trail of some sort, and Donovan knew where it would lead to. The trail ended at a woman's bathroom door, and there was some motion inside. Donovan could feel life from behind the door. This was an amazing feeling. For every second he spent in the cloud of this horrible stench of suffering and misery felt like a lifetime. Hey, I'm here to take you. You're safe, he said as he knocked on the door. Mike is with me, and Frank's waiting for you across the street at the bar. I'm not one of them. Trust me. Slowly, the door opened a crack, and Donovan turned it fully to reveal a woman, young, short, brown of hair and eyes, pointing her gun at him. She had a look in her eyes, equal parts fear and anger in her. You're human? She assured herself, but Donovan replied. Yeah, get the others. We have to go, now. We need to leave this town. She called out, and two other people revealed themselves from the back of the bathroom. There was another woman. She had blonde hair and blue eyes, wearing a simple coat and a pair of jeans. She was a middle-aged lady perhaps a little around Donovan, or even older. Then, there was another woman, a younger one. She was blonde as well, with sparkling green eyes and spotless skin. She was way younger than the both of them, and she was the last to appear. She wore a jacket on top of heavy clothing, making her head appear slightly smaller in proportion to her body. There was another person here, wasn't there? Donovan couldn't remember exactly, but there were more people that Mike had called out to, as far as he could remember. Y yeah, Ross went down to get the bus ready. So they had a bus. Donovan couldn't be any more thankful. He just motioned for the ladies to follow him as he ran back down the trail, now slightly fainter than before, but still strong, until he reached the counter again, where he found Mike on top of the counter firing at the army of hungry chatterers around him. Donovan aimed his pistol and shot one of them down, which turned their attention to Donovan again, walking towards him. Mike took this opportunity to brush past them and run down the stairs, away from these horrible things, followed by the ladies and Donovan. The space from where the exhaust fan had been removed was very small, and Kristen and Jim were the only ones who could fit, if Mr. Rosen had estimated correctly. Kristen looked at everyone and nervously nodded. She had to go out there. This was their only chance of making it out alive. The moments made more desperate when the creatures had started hitting their heads on the walls and windows to crack them open. She squeezed through the tiny space, avoiding looking down below at the swamp of hungry, chattering teeth out for her flesh. They probably hadn't noticed her, or were all staring at her as she moved. These were disturbing thoughts that Kristen tried hard not to entertain. The chatterers would not touch her. She was safe up here. She would crawl out of this tight hole and up to the ledge of the top corner of the roof. She would be better up there, then help the others. She had not thought about how she would manage that, but she would figure something out. Surely, it would be a better vantage point up there, if not for the bloody mist. The idea stung like a scorpion as she realized all this effort was in vain. She still couldn't see through this mess until this mist cleared, which obviously wouldn't be for a very long time. She tried to get on her knees and peer as far off the edge of the roof as she could see. Uh, hey! Jim reached out a hand from the opening, and she took it, helping him up to the roof. He instantly held out his rifle and made a quick scan around himself. He was apparently not in any immediate danger as far as he could tell. He then reached for his flashlight, which was hanging from his belt, and switched it on, handing it to Kristen. 
She scanned around in the dark mist, pointing the bright light toward the ground, and fortunately, it did light up the area it was pointed at. The chatterers were surrounding the bar, trying desperately to get in. Frank and Mr. Rosen were still in there, and they had to get them out now. Kristen felt like this was something she had to do, and she started thinking of any escape she could try for the both of them to make it out. The screech of a vehicle interrupted her thoughts as she turned to face the direction of the noise. The source was hidden by the black mist, but she could make out the shape of a bus. Jim had his rifle pointed at the bus, knowing what it carried. He had hoped to cover whomever came out of there first, protecting them from these things. Donovan jumped out first, holding Mike's rifle in his arms and opening fire on the swarm of chatterers. Some fell, others stumbled to Donovan on their own pace, who kept firing. Donnie! Kristen shouted out to him. Come around the back, 30 seconds! Donovan replied, still shooting these demons as they came at him, hungry for the life he had in him. She watched the back door slightly unlock, and Frank and Mr. Rosen rushed out of the room, weapons in hand. Frank kept shooting at anything still lurking at their sides, while Mr. Rosen held out his blade, ready to strike anything that got too close. Frank! Kristen called out to him. He looked up at her when he had the chance, after putting a bullet in the chattering woman who had gotten too close. She helped Jim give him one of her hands and lowered him down towards his father, who helped him down once he reached the ledge near the exhaust. She then tried to lower herself, but she couldn't. One more attempt, but she felt stuck. The screech of the bus on the icy road filled her with a sense of urgency. It had to be now. Frank and Mr. Rosen kept urging her to reach down, but now they were too distracted by the bus right in front of them. Frank and Mr. Rosen rushed to the bus, Jimmy following them. She saw the swarm of chatterers approaching and smelt the horrible stench of misery they carried. She also heard Donovan calling her and the chattering of the swarm. All this violation of sense was too much for her, and in a moment of intense mental chaos, she jumped right down landing on her legs and cracking one of them, unable to even lift herself up. Donovan! She shouted out as the swarm surrounded her and bent down to grab her. She let out a hand in hopes of Donovan or someone taking it and pulling her out of certain death, but nothing came. The chattering grew louder and louder as the things had their mouths close in on her. She let out another scream and then... Silence. The world had lost all sound as she felt like she was fading away. The chatterers began to fall, one by one, as Donovan's rifle hit them. He was all out of bullets, but he wouldn't leave Kristen here to die. He couldn't. She felt herself fade completely, and the next thing she saw was being in Donovan's arms as he carried her to the bus. And then, complete darkness took her as they drove. Donovan watched the crowd of chatterers halt and watched them leave in the bus on the icy road. There was a sudden tremor, and Donovan, along with all others, watched from the back of the window as what appeared to be a gigantic tree sprouted from the icy ground just in the middle of the swarm. The tall tree had many branches, but no leaves. It towered over the bar its shadow even falling on the roof of the theater. In its presence, the mist seemed fainter, as if it absorbed the black substance. Its branches swayed around like arms, while the trunk remained unmoving. Donovan wanted to look away, but couldn't. The chatterers bent down and were on their knees, bowing to the great tree. The insides of the trees started to glow red-hot, or at least that's what it looked like to Donovan. There was complete silence in the bus when the sound of chattering interrupted it. Kristen had begun to chatter in her slumber. Chris, Mr. Rosen asked, concerned for this girl. She didn't respond, but kept chattering occasionally. Donovan shook her to awaken her, which worked. She opened her eyes, 
and sat upright. She held Donovan in an embrace and started to cry. She cried and cried, sniffing and coughing as she did. Donovan, please, don't let it happen, she said as she cried. Mr. Rosen watched the girl break down while Donovan looked around helplessly. Everyone had been staring at her. Some were confused, others were scared. Mr. Rosen noticed Frank reaching for his rifle. That's when he had had enough. Kristen, he called out to her. She turns to face him, letting go of Donovan, and now using her hands to wipe off the streaming tears. It's okay. It'll be all right. Mr. Rosen told her in a fatherly tone. This comforted her a little. Stop the bus, Donovan said to the driver. What? Stop it, Donovan said. The bus stopped once they reached a clear area with no chatterers or anything in sight. Frank offered to light a candle, but Donovan assured him that he wouldn't be long. She needs some air, that's all. He assured all of them. Kristen got out first, still sobbing, followed by Donovan. They walked out and away from the bus, walking till they were out of sight. Donovan, I'll be all right, won't I? She wanted him to reassure her, like Mr. Rosen had. Yes, he said, a slight tremor in his voice. Tony, please don't let me die. I don't want to die, she said, again in her shaking voice. This time, she was chattering out of her control. It continued happening, and Donovan took a deep breath inhaling the now strong scent that he had hoped that he left behind, raising his pistol at Kristen, who was getting closer to him, still chattering her teeth together, and shot her in the heart, dropping her to the cold, icy ground. He let it all out at once. Fuck! He screamed as his eyes boiled with tears. Kristen's pale corpse stood up, chattering, as she walked towards him. He didn't even care this time. Let her decide what his fate was to be. He didn't want to live in this hell anymore. He had known she was not Kristen anymore when he had felt her broken spine when she embraced him. She had been killed by the army of chatterers, and what was left was not Kristen but a passenger of her skin. Or maybe it was Kristen. He didn't know. He didn't want to know. All he wanted was the sweet release of death. She tackled him to the ground and chattered, her fingers reaching for his jaws, when suddenly she fell back to the ground. A loud grunt and sounds of struggling confused Donovan. Mr. Rosen held Kristen from behind, inserting his knife deep into her throat, as her chattering grew more frantic, making her gums bleed. There was a sudden, deep thrust, and the blood spurted out of Kristen as she fell, unmoving on the ground, bleeding. The freshness of her corpse sickened Donovan, but Mr. Rosen stood up quietly, blood covering his sweater and some portions of his face. He looked at Donovan while he took Kristen's jacket and cut off a piece, using the blade she gave him and tucked it in his pocket. He didn't say a word to Donovan, and Donovan didn't say a word to him. This was the world they were in now, a harsh, far crueler reality, where the monsters in people had finally manifested themselves and were revealed to the world in shining light. 
Maybe they were monsters in this world, too. And after what they had done to Kristen, Donovan doubted his humanity. And also Mr. Rosen's, who didn't say a word the entire way back to the bus. They didn't know where they were off to, but wherever they were going, it was going to be a long ride. They had lost one of them already, and it doesn't matter what it takes. They were not going to lose another. This was the night the dead danced. Kristen now danced along with them. Hopefully, in a far better place than this hell. There are often times when man's faith comes into question. Desperate times as these make men turn to darker paths and often turn themselves into monsters. Demons emerge from the depths of hell in such times and torments the living, sinners, and the innocents alike. This was that time for this man, sitting alone and bare-skinned on a coarse seat of wood, dripping with his own sweat and blood. He stinks, for time has not been kind to him, especially right now. He has managed to bite through one of the ropes that bound him to his throne of pain, but now he struggled to move, as all the new pain from struggling has left him weaker than he has ever felt before. His uniform was gone. All the honor, the glory, the zeal that he had hoped for was all just a sweet lie. War is hell. That was the only truth now. No longer did he identify himself as a soldier, but as a victim. The door was still shut as always, the sound of the silence driving him to the doors of insanity. The captors did not care anymore. The war was still going on, and the life of one British pilot meant nothing to them. For all he knew, they could have left him here for good. It had been almost a week, or at least it felt like one. The room was tiny and dank, furnished only by the chair he ached to separate himself from. His blood from all the torture greased the floor, while growls of an empty stomach tore him apart from within. Minor discomforts compared to the bigger picture he found himself in. One more swing and he went down on the cold floor. He didn't care for the pain and the shock of falling anymore. Didn't care about anything at all except for his escape from that dreadful seat. And then, closed his eyes, bracing the floor with his chest, trying to shed tears, but his body would not allow this to happen. Then he remembered the word of his fellow cellmate in the POW camp. A mumbling man lost his sanity after crashing down into this cursed place like many others. There are demons in the trees. I see them now. Poor lad. He was a young man. The crash had taken both his legs as well as his sight. He mumbled day and night, reciting strange poetry and singing songs with such depth of voice it seemed all too inhuman. He terrified all the other soldiers he was locked up with. Even the guards avoided him, which was strange, considering how ruthless Nazis were known to be. They listen, but they never speak. His voice still echoed around in his head, murmuring as always. He was a very strange person, but in this desperate time, he understood the blind man. After all, the tall being with its head covered in perhaps hundreds of twisted horns standing there, watching him struggle to complete the pentagram of his own blood and filth, was no part of his imagination. What the fuck is that? Mike shouted out. Standing on top of the bus gave him a better vantage point, and rightfully so. He was an energetic and aggressive man. He would alert them as soon as he saw even the smallest thing approach from a distance. Mike lifted his cap and rubbed his bare head. His rifle hung from his right arm, and his red jacket flowed along the direction of the cold winds. Donovan stepped on the ladder behind the bus and climbed up. Mike pointed out in the distance. I don't see anything but ice, Donovan said to Mike. 
Donovan's beard had tiny amounts of snow stuck in it. His hair was also growing longer. Out there, there's something, man. Look, way to the right. It's there. Look. Mike insisted. Donovan didn't like Mike that much, but he had to admit, Mike did have a better gaze than himself. Donovan looked over to where Mike had been pointing to, and of course, there was something there. What is it? Tara, Mike's sister, asked from below. She had brown hair and brown eyes, shielding herself from the wind by a layer of thick fur she had found earlier that same day. Mike didn't care to answer her. There was a certain illusion of superiority over her that he wanted to maintain, but of course, the Boy Scout standing just next to him would be obliged to answer his sister. It looks like some sort of... I don't really know. Whatever it is, it's big. It's not a creature. Looks more like a statue or something. I don't know. We might have to check it out. Donovan answered Terra. Ross was lying underneath the bus, trying to get the bus moving again, but all efforts seemed useless to him. Frank sat by his side, ready to assist. He knew a thing or two about engines, or at least told himself that. His boy walked around, patrolling the bus with his rifle, wanting to feel useful along with everyone else while his mother was asleep back in the bus. Amber sat cross-armed next to Frank and Ross, hoping to learn something, but that's all she ever did. Sit cross-armed and wait. She felt anger sometimes, unable to lend a hand in anything or not being looked as someone who could pick up a weapon and fight if needed, but rather always seen as a girl who needed a wall of protection around herself. Donovan got down from the ladder and walked over to Ross, who, on hearing Donovan walk by, slid out from underneath the bus and stood up to face him. We can't use this truck any longer. It's beyond helping. Ross conveyed this news to Donovan, which should have despaired him, but instead he just looked over the side where he saw Mr. Rosen in the distance. Don, we have to move on our feet. We can't take the bus anymore, man. She's gone. Ross repeated himself to Donovan, orated that Donovan was not taking this as seriously as he should. Yeah, well, that's fine. She's not what I'm concerned about. He watched as Mr. Rosen stood still, his dark coat swaying along, his long hair and beard messy and dull. Mr. Rosen! Donovan called out. Yeah, he answered back in a slow but deep tone. The bus isn't working anymore. The Ross can't get it to move. He had hoped that Mr. Rosen would jump at this opportunity to try and get the bus moving again, but he was left disappointed. I guess then we walk. Mr. Rosen walked towards the bus slowly, each step digging into the thick snow as he did. Let's move, shall we? Those things will be here sometime, or who knows, maybe they already are here. Mr. Rosen said coldly, maintaining his pace. Jesus, what's wrong with this man? Donovan thought to himself, following Mr. Rosen and Ross following him. Donovan, we don't even know which way to move. Ross was right. He didn't. There, he said, pointing to the direction of the Titan Mike had spotted earlier. It was not an easy journey. Julia could not walk as much, especially in the ice, which trapped feet with every step. This was bound to happen sometime. She knew it. There would be a time when the bus wouldn't be able to make it on the road. The ice would get too thick sometime, and then they would have to walk. What she hadn't expected was to live to experience it. This was a dangerous world, after all. Amber walked, her arms still crossed to shield from the cold. She was not accustomed to the silence, but out here, while the group was on foot, silence was their wisest choice so as to not attract any unwanted attention. She tried not to think of her parents, or home back in Australia. She had hoped that whatever had struck this land steered clear of her homeland, but deep down, a part of her already accepted the alternative. Mike, Tara, 
Frank, Donovan, and Jim held their weapons, forming a circular formation to defend the group. Mr. Rosen walked ahead with calm and carelessness, wielding a pistol. Donovan watched him, so calm, so unconcerned. There was something wrong with this man ever since the day Kristen was killed, ever since the day she died. Perhaps he was plagued by guilt, but then that would mean Donovan was not, and the idea struck him colder than the hell he was walking on right now. His thought then drifted to possible chances of attack, which he hoped to God wouldn't happen. They were running short on ammo, and a possible attack would prove to be lethal now. How much longer do we need to keep walking? Julia was exhausted. That yell had taken a lot to release itself. Shh. Frank hushed her. He looked over to Donovan, his gaze asking the same question. Donovan looked over to Julia, who was cringing at her mistake of shouting out this yell. Mike? Donovan asked the person who saw the thing for the longest out of all of them. Not too long. It's next to that telephone tower. We follow this line a little longer and we're there. Mike, you do know we can't afford to stay out here at night? Ross spoke out. He was more worried than the others were, as he wielded nothing but a crowbar. There was not many weapons to pass around. This wasn't like the movies. There were no gun shops lying around randomly. Even if they were, they were already raided, or too dangerous to enter. The crowbar was his last option, which, even though he was reluctant to have it as his only weapon, he refused Donovan's offer to trade weapons, knowing that the gun would do much better in Donovan's hands. Yeah, well, just a little more. We can make it. Donovan set out, standing straight, holding his gun in front of him. The darkness was taking over, and the stars were going to be out soon. Ever since the power finally went out, the stars were clearer than ever. There was virtually no light pollution. You can't be serious. We don't even know what's out there, Mike. Uh, come on, uh, Donovan, tell him. Uh, Frank? Ross looked around desperately for anyone to agree with him, but people stood silent. Well, it's worth a shot. Donovan seemed to agree with Mike. We stay said a deep voice. Everyone turned to face the cold man, Harold Rosen, who had his hands deep in the pockets of his coat, facing towards something in the distance. We stay there. It was not a suggestion, more of a command. Mike walked over to Mr. Rosen, who pointed over to what appeared to be a police station. No, man, we can't stay over there. We don't know what there may be. Mike was hesitant. To him, Mr. Rosen came off as an unpredictable man. Mr. Rosen put his hands to his sides and looked Mike in the eyes, who tried to avert his gaze by looking down into the icy terrain to avoid Mr. Rosen's piercing stare. We stay. Mr. Rosen pointed his finger with an aggressive motion to the station. Here. End of story. Mr. Rosen said. Mike didn't utter another word. Mr. Rosen's word was final, and he listened. This man was unarmed, yet he made Mike feel powerless. That night was rough. The police station was raided of all guns and weapons, like Ross had expected, which was to his disappointment. Mr. Rosen watched the stars shine while everyone slept in the space of the empty building, which had been checked fully first. Frank was on the night watch, and he watched Donovan stare blankly at the stars, standing next to the huge window. Mike was on duty on the other side of the hall, in case they'd missed something else inside. Can't sleep? Frank asked Mr. Rosen. No. A conversation was hopeless with this man. Frank was about to walk back when Mr. Rosen spoke out. Beautiful, isn't it? The stars out there. Yeah. Well, I hope whatever's going on up there, it's way better than this down here. Hell is going on all around us, 
and yet the world seems to be the most beautiful it has ever been before. First God sent the floods, maybe now he sent us this, maybe we sinned enough, and now it's time to clean up, maybe all this is inevitable. We are still alive, aren't we? We're the lucky ones, maybe. Frank tried to be a little more optimistic. Or maybe just at the back of the line of the slaughterhouse. Mr. Rosen looked up and exhaled a thick white mist from his breath. Either way, we're fucked. Frank had had enough. Yeah, I guess. He didn't want any more of this conversation. Uh, try getting some sleep, Harold. You got a long walk ahead tomorrow. And with that, Frank walked around, back to patrol the station. The morning came, and after looking around for food and water and finding none, they decided to move on, walking towards that giant they saw in the distance. Mike gazed one last time over from the roof of the station to confirm its position, and indeed, it still stood there, as still as ever. None of them knew exactly what they had hoped to find out there, but there was something there, and they had to know what. This time, Mike leads the group, Donovan following from behind the group, ensuring that nothing follows them. Amber walked next to Jimmy, who held a rifle in his young hands. He had a schoolboyish look on his face, Amber thought. He was a young adolescent boy, probably she could persuade him to hand over his rifle for once. She caught him quietly gazing over at her, enthralled by her perfect blonde hair, even in this mess. Perfect, she thought. This was her chance. Donovan kept walking ahead, following closely behind Mike's trail. Mike stopped walking, and this threw Donovan's flow off. Hey, man, you sure we should all be going over there together? Mike asked nervously to Donovan. Um... Donovan looked at everyone, slowly stopping their movement. Yeah, safer that way. Mike agreed and they continued. Right next to a tall building, besides the telephone tower, there were no buildings in sight for a large distance, except a few of those strange tree-like things that rose when they had faced off the chattering crowd. Their branches swaying in harmony, dancing a morbid dance to the sound of the cold atmosphere. There was a path made by them, leading up to the tall thing in the distance. It was huge, at least twenty feet tall, a white structure, and appeared to be made of ice, or something similar in appearance to ice. Ah, oh, shit. They're the same things these trees surrounded. Donovan, I have a bad feeling about this, man. Ross held his crowbar in two hands now as he spoke. We move together. We stay together. No matter what. Donovan declared. Everyone was on guard this time. Ross felt safer with Donovan's gun, now that Donovan finally persuaded him to hold on to a gun, giving Donovan the crowbar. The walk felt like the longest walk anyone had ever had. No one knew what they would find at the end of this path, and whether they would like it or not. Mike was the first to see it. Then, Terra. It was a giant carving on a huge pile of ice. It had carvings of humans and hideous beings that one could only assume to be either some god or demons, the latter being more likely. It depicted scenes of torture and suffering, of men being hung upside down with their entrails being consumed by demonic beasts, and of huge horned beings sexually violating women and men alike. It showed images of fear and pain so well that one could almost hear the lost screams of those depicted in this grotesque imagery. Amber looked away immediately and held the gun to her hand a little closer to herself. It made her feel safer that way. Jimmy, on the other hand, probably regretted ever giving her his weapon, but tried to put on a brave face in a bid to impress Amber, to look tough. But that didn't go very well. Smell that? 
Tara asked Julia, standing by her side. Chocolate, Julia replied. It smells like chocolate. She was confused, taking in a deeper breath and confirming the fact that indeed it smelled of chocolate, whatever this thing was. I smell lavender, Tara told Julia. Julia's reaction said it all. She and Tara both knew what this meant. Whatever it was, it smelled different to everyone. Frank, what do you smell? Julia asked her husband. Bacon. Julia laughed and Tara joined in. Frank followed suit. Donovan just smiled and so did Mr. Rosen. Amber smelled something else entirely. She smelled jam. Something she had loved as a kid, reminding her of her childhood and her family. Whoa! Mike let out, startling everyone. He raised his gun to his left. Donovan reached for his crowbar, and Tara raised her gun. A well-dressed man emerged from behind the sculpture, walking calmly with one hand in his pocket towards the group. Amber thought about how handsome this man looked, and she looked at the other ladies to confirm that they saw the same thing. The looks on their faces said that they did. The man was tall, around six feet in height, with pale skin, dressed in a well-fitting suit like one of those men's fashion commercials on the television when there still was television. He had black, neatly slicked back hair, glistening. He was well-built and had a well-defined jawline and blank eyes. A blank as snow. He approached them slowly, not fearing their weapons. Who are you? Donovan called out to him. Jeffrey Bronson. He sniffed the air. You are alive. Good for you. He walked towards the giant sculpture and continued his work on it, scratching the ice, tearing down big chunks, and giving precise details to this art. What the hell is wrong with you? Mike asked. Hell. That is precisely what is wrong with me. He answered in a loud, clear voice. He's a demon, Donovan. We have to kill it, man. Ross said to Donovan with pleading eyes, handing him the gun. Not a demon. Just Faust is how I'll describe myself. Like Faust. Donovan was confused. It means he sold his soul. Mr. Rosen helped Donovan's confusion. Precisely. Except the concept of selling your soul is not really how it works. I choose this side in exchange for... Well, won't bore you with the details, but I gave my soul. And now, I must ensure their arrival into your plane. He spoke with such elegance... It was frightening. Hell, heaven, those are childish concepts. You won't even begin to grasp the reality of these realms, these planes. Insanity creeps close. Donovan had enough for this talk. What are you building? He asked the man. A temple. The man answered back. Could you help us? Amber asked him. He turned to face her. His face showed no emotion at all. Then turned back, continuing his work. Come on, let's leave, Donovan told the group. Mike raised his gun to the man, taking aim, ready to fire, just when Frank lowered his gun by pressing it down. They walked back from where they had come, disappointed to not find anything. It was getting dark again. The nights seemed to arrive faster these days. In the nights, they decided to take shelter in the same station again, everyone taking their positions and getting ready to rest for the remaining day. Another day ending with empty bellies and thirsty throats. It was dark and midnight when Donovan heard the glass shatter. He woke up with a jolt. Mike was on the watch. Mike? 
he shouted out. Mr. Rosen was the next to stand up. At this point, no one was asleep anymore. Tara stood by the broken shards, picking one up, picking up a shard covered in blood. Oh, fuck me. Frank let out. Mike? Donovan grabbed a flashlight and pointed it outwards, revealing a disturbing sight. Mike lay on the ground, bleeding. His body twitched on the ice. Mike? Tara let out a screech, running towards her brother. Tara, stop! Donovan called out to her, but to no avail. She ran up to him and sat down next to her bleeding brother. Yeah? Someone called out from behind. Everyone in the station turns to find Mike walking up, running towards them, zipping up his pants as he did. Fuck! Donovan let out a yell and rushed to get out, Mike running behind him. The flashlight pointed around, revealing the other Mike on the ground had no legs, but instead, its waist was attached to a gigantic serpent's tongue, which then hissed while flapping its tongue and retracted it back into its mouth. It opened its jaw to reveal a mouth full of fangs, and Mike kept on firing at it. Tara was in shock and frozen where she stood. The thing let out a roar like sound, and in one motion, closed its massive jaws around Tara, swallowing her whole. Mike charged at it, tears running through his eyes and shooting at it like crazy, until the inevitable happened. He ran out of bullets. Donovan continued shooting at the giant serpent, which spit out Terra, broken and mutilated. Her skin dissolved in on itself as she lay, lifeless, covered in yellow phlegm on the ground. Mike kept screaming at the top of his lungs as he cried, hitting that thing with everything he had. Mr. Rosen tried to get Mike, but felt that the snake had its eyes on Mike. Frank continued firing while insisting to his family to stay in the station. The thing now bent its head again, this time going for Frank. Donovan rushed to Frank and tried to grab onto him, but the thing pulled Frank with such great force that Donovan was pulled along with him. With Frank now in his mouth and half of Donovan's left arm in there, he closed his eyes, awaiting his death. But a sharp pain stung him in the arm and he fell back on the ground, with blood spouting from what was left of his left arm. He let out a cry in pain while Amber held the bloody knife that had severed a good portion of Donovan's arm, the rest being pulled apart by the snake and Donovan's weight. Donovan's head spun in this agony, and he could make out only one word for Amber. He read her lips as saying, sorry, over and over, and weeping. Mr. Rosen grabbed her shoulders and pulled her back from the snake's range. Donovan passed out from the bleeding. Everything was going dark, and the only sound he could hear was Mike violently letting out uninterpretable sounds. Jim ran to the snake, which had taken his father, and started shooting towards the thing. It had happened so fast that Julia didn't have a chance to hold him back. She kept screaming in tears for him to come back. The snake finally took notice of Jim and spat out the dead corpse of his father right at him, sending him down to the ground with his head hitting the cold, and then aiming to snatch him up into its jaws. Just then, the snake looked up and sniffed in the air. Something else was here. Two gigantic beings, humanoid in shape but covered in what appeared to be horns on every inch of their skin, began to pull the thing down with sheer strength. Their wide horns stained the bleeding thing as they pierced them into its body, ripping it apart. Mike tried to run back, but was startled by a gigantic beast on a chain. It was covered in brown fur, was as big as a bear, but had an exposed skull for a face. Mike's line of sight followed the chain back to the owner, a tall man dressed in a white robe on what appeared to be a horse, again lacking any flesh on its head, only bone. 
He had cold, unblinking eyes and looked down at him. There was something in the man's hand. It was a speaker. The man pressed the play button. My name is Donovan Black. The time is currently 530 hours, or 5.30 a.m. The sun should have been rising right about now, but it's still dark out there. The entire journey was a blur. The horrible concoction of screams and cries. Some restraints were definitely used. Amber was sure of it. She had woken up from a deep slumber, not sure how long she was asleep for. She felt weak as she tried to sit up. She felt the thin air of dried spittle, forming a line down the side of her lips. She had definitely been sedated. She remembered that Donovan had been too. Oh yeah, what about Donovan? Where is he? Where is everyone else? She tried to trace back her memories and follow the trail to the events that led her right here in this room. There was a mattress on the floor where she had slept, probably for hours, maybe days. She couldn't know. Standing up, she placed a hand on her head, rubbing it slightly, still feeling a little off. Her stomach growled, unnoticed by her. She was too preoccupied trying to think back, think back and remember. The memory came to her with cruel clarity, all that fear she had in her, crawling from under her skin to let itself out, had now gotten its oh-so-sweet release as she let out a laugh. What the fuck was the matter with me? She thought. This isn't funny, but clearly it seems like it was. Surely it was. It had to be. Otherwise, she wouldn't feel like... Another loud laugh, and she held her chest, running her hands over her beating heart, which pounded harder and harder as her laughs grew louder. She felt her eyes now moistening with tears as she sat down by the nearest chair and pulled at her messy, blonde hair, laughing even louder. In her hysteria, pain had taken over her laughs, and every laugh ended with a painful cry of both horror and grief. Pain is what assured her of her sanity, because for a moment she felt as if she almost fell into the deep abyss that was madness. Mr. Rosen knew patience well. All his life he was known to be a patient man, but this weight was testing his limits. The emotionless and unfeeling man had set him down on a seat of the long table in what appeared to be a rearranged chapel. The statues were missing, instead replaced by poorly made carvings of ice, sculptures that even the likes of Mr. Rosen couldn't decipher. The room was lit by the natural light seeping in through the windows, which was dim, but he was used to it now. The stone-faced man had been calm and composed, politely directing him here when he woke up in the morning. He was strolling around, trying to remember where he was, when he stumbled upon the man in the halls. Come with me. That was the only thing he said. Something told Mr. Rosen that even if he didn't want to go, he didn't have much of a choice. In his boredom, he observed the man. He didn't care if his staring was not discreet enough, that manners and conduct were a concept lost in the world he was in now. The man was older, perhaps older than him or around his age. He could tell by the graying hair remaining on his slightly balding head. The man had colored eyes, sunk and lined with age. There were traces of a patchy beard on his face. A woman walked in the room, wearing the same monochromatic robe as the man. She was in her forties, Rosen estimated, red hair and beautiful yet melancholic eyes, carrying her thin, possibly anorexic frame with hands on Amber's shoulders as she moved. Amber had been crying, Mr. Rosen could tell by her bloodshot eyes. Sitting directly across him, she was silent, her tears now dry, her eyes swollen. She looked at the table or perhaps through it, lost in her grief. 
Mr. Rosen would have comforted her, probably should have said something, but he remained cold. He sat upright, leaning back in his chair and just blankly glancing at her. He didn't want to break the silence. There was no need to. All small talk would be useless anyway. They were just one, two, three, four, four dead people sitting around a long table waiting for nothing. Death would find them as it found Chris Gilligan. Then came Jimmy, Frank's boy, followed by Mike, who had to be restrained physically by a huge man, a rather tall man, at least 6'5". Mike sat down on the table as well. He was calmer, obviously not willing. Then the waiting ended, when a man wearing a glorious black robe and a hood entered, escorting a party of three people two of them carrying the third man on a chair into the room. Donovan was in agony, poorly attempting to conceal it. His face gave his pain away. Whatever this was, it was definitely urgent. The man in the black robe appeared to be in charge. He had the men behind him place Donovan next to Jimmy, who was in his own little confinement of pain. The man then walked over to his seat the prime seat at the end of the table and looked everyone once over, then sat. He had a mask on, a strange mask matching nothing from Mr. Rosen's memory of masks. This was just pale white and oddly shaped. There were two tiny holes in the eyes. There were no features, no spaces for other features either. It was oddly flat. Not perfectly, but a little unsettlingly flat for a human. Mr. Rosen looked around to confirm the fact that this was, in fact, the only man wearing a mask in the room. Welcome to the cathedral. I assume you are Donovan Black? The man said in a weak voice, almost as if in a nervous whisper. The voice gave away the fact that the man was probably very old, probably in his seventies, possibly even older. Me? Mr. Rosen couldn't tell who the man was looking at, but assumed that it was him. Yes. No. Why? We found your messages. We've been looking for you for a long time. Are you with Mr. Black? There was a lady with us. Where is she? Mr. Rosen demanded, now in a louder voice. Well, the boy can assure you that his mother is safe and asleep in her room. She is not as strong as the boy. Whatever happened, it was unfortunate. Judging by your looks, I feel like it is safe to assume that many of you have lost people, and you do have my deepest sympathies with you. But let me tell you this, that pain, that feeling, you must get used to it. Are you Mr. Donovan Black? No, he isn't. I am. Donovan said, fighting the urge to scream. Ah, Mr. Black, you are lucky we found your group when we did. Boris over here. The man pointed to the cold, unfeeling man who had escorted Mr. Rosen to this room. He has been tracking you for days. You have been wandering into dangerous territory. You and your group, Fausts, they are always surrounded by the worst of demon kind. Demons? Mr. Rosen said. Yes, that is what they are. Oh, so you didn't know. Yes, they are demons. Hell has opened its gates. And yes, Mr. Black, God has turned away. How do you know all this? Who are you? Some kind of angel? Mr. Rosen asked, a hint of aggression in his tone. A lot of questions you must have, and I understand. But be patient. Maybe I have a question for you too, Mr. Rosen. Harold. Mr. Rosen, tell me, whom did you lose? 
You might think that you are the strongest amongst your group, but let me assure you, if someone has been wounded the deepest, it is most certainly you. Men never stay this calm after going through what you did. If you try to conceal it, it will end up hurting you. I learned that from my many years. And to answer your question, no, Mr. Rosen, we are not angels. We are, but, let me say, learners. The man paused for a second. What does that mean? I don't understand. Who are you? Mr. Rosen asked again, the same defiance in his tone. Another bastard child, Mr. Rosen. A bastard child of God. A bastard child like you. Like Mr. Black. Like Boris. Like everyone to be born and to have been born. And what you see out there, that is what bastard children get. The man sure likes to hear himself speak, Mr. Rosen thought. He didn't know if whatever was coming out of this man's mouth was true or not. All he wanted now was something to believe, a reason, no matter how plausible, to believe in. They couldn't just keep on going without knowing. The man stood up and called out to the tall man. Brian. A single word, and the man fetched a box from beside his feet. It was definitely heavy, something the old man would have trouble carrying himself. We are strong together. Alone we die, one by one. The old man said, while Brian emptied the contents of the box on the table. The serpents that had attacked them was there, lifeless and without the luxury of a body. Its head lay unmoving on the table, defanged and badly mutilated with a variety of cuts and holes from what appeared to be tusks or horns. With that, the man ended his speech and ordered for food to be served. Nothing fancy, just cans of stored food. Probably some of them expired. But days of hunger had left everyone weak, and even though they were all limited to just two cans of beans and a bottle of water each, they felt fulfilled. Their stomachs were still hungry, but their hearts were content. A brighter time was ahead. Food, safety, comfort... They were to have it all now. The old man walked over to Mr. Rosen and asked him to accompany him. Suspicious at first, but then uncaring. Mr. Rosen followed. Even if I get stabbed to death or something, I don't really care. I was a dead man walking anyway. At least ever since this world came to be what it is. He thought to himself, following the masked man down to the church basement. It was dark, and the lights were all off. Mr. Rosen, can I trust you? Mr. Rosen was confused. Harold, was it? Can I call you Harold? Mr. Rosen just nodded. Sometimes a man must have some darkness in his heart to lead others to light. Remember that, Harold. Mr. Rosen was confused, but he could see that the old man was pointing towards the dark basement, motioning him to walk. He took a step and then felt the wooden floor creak a little. The old man patted him on the back and he turned around. He had a candle in his hand, a white candle, already dripping wax, probably used many times. He took the candle and walked straight ahead. It was dark, and he was afraid of stumbling and falling, or much worse, being trapped in here. There were no sounds. Everything was awfully still in the dark, which was very unsettling, considering that this room didn't feel very empty. Mr. Rosen didn't feel alone here. At the end of the hall, he stood. It wasn't a short walk, either. The hall felt like it was longer than it should have been. At the end, there was a tiny table with a candlestick. He lit it up using the candle he held, the wax coating his cold, numb hands. 
His hands now shivered slowly as more of the room was visible. The candlesticks had made the entire room glow in its orange aura. It was a bright light. In the dimness of the room, in the left corner, he saw a cage. The cage, to his disgust, was not empty. There were people in there. People who had their fingers interconnected with the mesh of the cage, staring at Donovan. There was one man, two women, and two children. One boy and one girl. Their faces were cold and unfeeling. Something Mr. Rosen should have anticipated with the way the candle reacted. These were not humans. They were similar skin, but they were not humans. He went closer to inspect them out of a twisted sense of curiosity. Step by step, moving closer, anticipating a sudden movement to scare the living daylights out of him and make him drop the candle, leaving him in darkness. It never happened. They never moved, just stood still, staring at him with wide eyes. They looked human. Nothing about them was very different from himself. Well, at least not including the slit throats. These people weren't alive. They just stared blankly at Mr. Rosen. Their chests remained still. There was no need to breathe. Death had taken them in a warm embrace. The old man waited for him outside, closing the door behind him as he exited the basement. Mr. Rosen wasn't even aware that there was one. Before you die, there is a moment where your body isn't quite dead, nor quite alive. The demons take it. These people are empty vessels. They are unoccupied. And even though they live in stillness, they still have their minds. No matter how cruel it is, we must keep them here. It is for our own protection, Mr. Rosen. I'm pretty sure you saw what killed that snake demon that attacked your group. That's what those people are. Just vessels for entities far more powerful to take over. Why did you tell me? Why me? Because you have to make a choice. This isn't Mr. Black's group anymore. It's yours. One person from your group ends up here. And the rest leave. Or join us. Join us and fight alongside us in this unholy war. Who are you? Really? Tell me. Hector M. Kane. Hector M. Kane. Mr. Rosen didn't know why he felt the need to repeat it. Make your choice, Mr. Rosen, and be quick. When the sun was setting, Mr. Rosen had been taking a lone stroll in the garden of the old church grounds. It wasn't just a stroll, but more of a mission. Kristen never had the proper burial. He has a little hole in the ground, pushing away the ice and the mud. It was a difficult chore, but he didn't care. This had to be done. He then cleaned the knife with his own jacket. He pulled out a piece of cloth from his pocket, which he tore off of Kristen's jacket. He wrapped it around the knife and placed it in the hole, covering it with ice and mud again. He then stood in silence for a moment. He knew he was alone. There was no one watching, and this was the perfect moment. No interruptions. No one will know where she is buried, except him. Kristen Gilligan, you were like the daughter I never had. You protected me from certain death on many occasions. You were my only company for all those terrible days when the world began to go to shit. Kristen, I failed you in the end. I did. It should have been me instead. Oh, God... I'd give anything for that exchange. In the end, Kristen, I promise you this. I won't have another death. Especially after what happened last night. I won't. I have to make a decision, Kristen. And I guess 
Knowing me, you already know what choice I made. Good night, Kristen. May you have a long and peaceful rest up there where it's safe. With that, he walked badly towards the cathedral. He had been given a big decision, and he had made his choice. The sun didn't rise that day. The temple had been built, and the arrival of their new king was awaited. The soulless man stood in front of his creation, his eyes an abyss, looking forward, standing his ground while swarms of chatterers arrived from every single lane ahead of the Temple of Hell. The pilgrims of Hell, like a wave of honey, moved forward slowly as they circled the creation, walking around it, still chattering their teeth till they bled. A blonde-haired chatterer, wearing the husk of what used to be 19-year-old Kristen Gilligan, walked along with the tribe, chattering like the rest. Nonetheless, all things unholy were welcome to this shrine of damnation and darkness, and as if to prove it, the soulless man extended his arms and looked up to the sky. His service to all things unholy. Then, from deep down his throat, he sang. It was a growl as much as a song, a tune not meant for mortal ears. The hauntingly serene yet maddening ballad rang out to the dark, sunless sky in this cold, godless world. The slow growls of the skinned beast buzzed through the cold winds. It was a horse, no skin covering its skull and no fur covering its skin. Jimmy was intrigued yet intimidated by these creatures. It was some kind of horse, accompanied by a dog-like beast sitting beside it, also relieved of all facial muscle and tissue. They're possessed. Jimmy turned back to see a heavily bearded man, clad in a black leather jacket and blue jeans, walk by. The man was covered in tattoos. They were on every visible speck of his skin, not sparing even the whites of his eyes, which were dyed a deep black. His appearance startled Jimmy a little, but he knew this wasn't a creature from outside. The cathedral was too secure for that to happen. What? Jimmy slowly stammered out. We have these possessed kids. Keep your distance from them. They can bite off your fingers like a breadstick, and they would sure as hell come for a second bite. He said, taking his leather glove off, exposing two missing fingers and letting a smirk out. Jimmy gulped at the sight of this. The man liked that. The man walked closer to him and bent down to Jimmy's height. I gotta check you, kid. Raise your arms up. Just the only guns. Jimmy shook his head in refusal, but the man started to run his hands along Jimmy's body, and though he was uncomfortable, he didn't feel if he had a say here. Jimmy, you okay? Donovan had just entered the tiny stable where the beasts were chained up with iron. Jimmy stared at the one-armed man's silhouette as he entered through the doorframe. There was still some blood clotting beneath the heavy bandages over what was left of his left elbow. The man stood up, turned around, and walked out without sparing a glance in Donovan's direction. Yeah, Jimmy sighed. The boy had been this way since his father died. His feelings about the whole ordeal were buried down somewhere. Mike was looking for you earlier, Jimmy said. Donovan just nodded and took it as a sign to leave the boy alone for now. After a concerned, be careful around here, Donovan left him in his solace. As he started to leave for Mike's room, he noticed the red-haired woman, who he had seen several times around the cathedral, standing next to a pillar supporting the cathedral from outside, blankly staring at him with her weak eyes. She looked tired and weak as she held on to the pole, 
her arms wrapped around it as if a creeper growing around a tree trunk. She looked down at the ground when she realized his gaze back on her and walked back into the cathedral, grabbing her white robe from the sides and holding it up as she did so as to not sweep the floor with it. He watched her as she went, holding herself as if she was made of a stack of delicate glass. Donovan found Mike in the far room right on the lowest level. From the look on Mike's face, it was apparent that something was very wrong with this man. His eyes had been reddened and swollen with dark circles bordering them. Mike stood up as he faced Donovan and walked over to him. You alone? Mike asked, scanning the hall behind the door that Donovan had come from. Were you followed? Tell me. Tell me. Mike spoke through gritted teeth. No. No. There's something wrong with this place. It ain't right, Don. I'm telling you. You spoke to Amber yet? Mike asked in a more hushed tone. No. No, she hadn't been out today. Donovan replied, now thinking about his answer. And Julia, Jimmy's mom. No, not her either. I thought she was sick. Donovan thought about this, his suspicion growing now. Bullshit. They aren't sick. There's something going on, man. I'm telling you, this pagan shit here, as if there ain't enough going on out there already. Take this. Mike extended his hand to Donovan, handing him the handle of a pistol. Wait, what the fuck are you gonna do, Mike? Don't let whatever happens let- Just shut up and take it. We need to know what the fuck's going on here. Mike hushed Donovan's words. Okay, uh, okay. Look, I'll talk to Rosen. Before he could finish, Mike cut him off again. No, not Rosen. You can't trust him. That fucking creep in the chair has him following around down to the basement. There's something down there, and we need to find out what. We've lost enough already, Don, and I'm not willing to risk it again. Can I trust you? Donovan nodded. I need to hear you say it, Don. Yes, you can trust me. Donovan said in a sigh. Good. Stay low and hide that gun. They don't know I have it on me. Donovan did not want to ask any questions, so he decided to just walk away from there, tucking the gun down in his pants, which proved to be a lot more challenging without the use of his left arm. Even though he had his own suspicions now, he still had to be careful. Mike had definitely not been sleeping well, and he was being paranoid for sure, but then again, he couldn't risk it. For now, he would try and look for anything suspicious, and he knew where he had to start. Mr. Rosen had been following Boris upstairs from the church basement. Boris had a hammer in his hand, and Mr. Rosen just looked down on his way up. The stairs were just next to the former church's altar, heavily vandalized with skulls of animals and horns of what Mr. Rosen only hoped were from animals as well, even though they had looked rather large. The statues had been thrown away, and the stained glass had been rid of the faces of holy figures by other stains. As he continued on walking, being the sole member of the group knowing what the cathedral had been hiding underneath its floors, he had been less interactive with the others, and now he thought the cathedral and these so-called priests were his only companions now. Boris was the Herculean beast of a man who never spoke much and didn't appear to take pleasure in the disturbing work they did. That was, feeding and caring for their captive vessels who served as living weapons and ensured their invisibility from the far terrible things out in the snow, and due to this, he did feel more comfortable working alongside him rather than other priests here. These people, even though they shared a little secret with him, still remained as much a mystery to him as much as to the others, and even though he was sure of them being involved in some far more hideous work, he turned a blind eye as long as they kept the group safe. Donovan had watched him walking upstairs when he decided to have a talk with him. Mr. Rosen had noticed him approaching and parted ways with Boris and moved to entertain Donovan's presence. Hey, how's the arm? Mr. Rosen asked coldly. Is there something you need to tell me? 
Donovan ignored his question and put up one of his own. Mr. Rosen was a little stunned by this manner of questioning and paused, creating a moment of silence which Donovan broke for him. Look, Mike thinks there's something up with this place and you've been acting strangely lately as well. Is everything okay? Well, yeah. Did Mike take the guns? These people have been looking for missing weapons, and if they turn their suspicions to me, I... we could get into trouble. Mr. Rosen ensured to be only loud enough for Donovan to listen. Mr. Rosen coughed and covered his mouth with his hands, keeping one hand on Donovan's right shoulder. Listen, son. Mike's probably still grieving. He's not alright. Just stay calm and don't cause any trouble. You have no idea what... Donovan abruptly cut him off midway. It's not just Mike. It's me too. Are you accusing me of something, Donovan? Just come out and say it. Mr. Rosen had anger stirring up in him. He clenched and unclenched his fists, not caring if it was obvious to Donovan, which it wasn't. I don't know. Are you feeling guilty? Donovan said without an expression. Fuck you. You don't know what I've had to do. Mr. Rosen said through gritted teeth. Where's Julia? Donovan asked, not caring for his tone and letting out loudly. A third voice had joined in, a loud and familiar voice. Julia? Was that the woman who lost her husband? The tattooed man spoke out from above them from a railing, chewing on something as he spoke. The man had climbed down the stairs like a snake slithering to its underground sanctuary and patted Donovan's left shoulder. Come on. He didn't look back, and he walked in a manner so jolly, it was as if he was an elf in a fucked up version of the North Pole. Donovan knew better than to follow him blindly and put his hand down to his pants and reached for the gun. Mr. Rosen looked at Donovan, giving him a look that said that he was as much in the dark as he was, but Donovan didn't believe him. He held the gun, following the man by the sound of his whistling to an ineligible tune down a hall and to a door, to which the man knocked thrice and then opened. Donovan let go of his gun when he saw Julia sitting on the bed with a cigarette in her hand. Her skin had gone pale and her eyes were still red. She had been crying for a long time, and perhaps still was, with her eyes running out of tears to shed. Julia? Donovan asked. She did not turn to him immediately, but placed the cigarette back in between her lips and took a deep inhale. Then, with the smoke in her lungs, she turned to Donovan and blew the smoke in his face. He moved away from her immediately and was about to say something again when she finally spoke. Fuck you, Donovan, and fuck your leadership. Julia, I... Stay the fuck away from my son. Frank's gone because of you. Your fucking decisions. Jimmy is safer here. He doesn't need you here. Now get out. Donovan was shocked. This had hurt him a lot. Why did she blame Frank's death on him? It hadn't been his fault. He had even lost an arm to save him. Or had he? It had all been his decision to leave the station to look at the ice sculptures that day. Donovan wanted to say something, but Julia burst into another fit of crying, and Mr. Rosen gently escorted him out of there, along with himself. She's just delirious. It isn't your fault. What happened happened. That wasn't your hand in there, son. Mr. Donovan offered these empty words to a broken man who needed a drink more than anything. He had spent the late afternoon sitting by the stable and staring at the dark skies above, trying so hard not to feel as he felt at the moment. He felt as if his soul inside was crying, but his eyes did not comply. Fuck, he murmured to himself slowly standing up and entering to look at the things. He knew that these things would just rub salt on his wound, but he didn't care. The memories of that night had been freshened up in his mind because of what Julia had said. He noticed the skinned horse and dog, 
apparently asleep or resting, but he was too afraid to get close to them. Those things were there on that night, and... Donovan froze. Deep thought had set in. There were other things, too. He was sure of it. Two horned things. There was definitely something hidden here, and he needed to know. In his current emotional state, he didn't care much for his actions and ran back to the cathedral. He needed to talk to Mike, but then, on entering the wooden interior of the godless chapel, he had realized that the basement was unguarded. Perhaps this was his only chance to see what was in there. Slowly, he crept down the stairs and into the dark room, lit by nothing but a small candlelight at the end of the room. He kept walking and walking. Then he halted. There was some sound. It sounded like squeaking. Something was rattling down there, under the basement, and he needed to know what it was. He slowly bent down and felt around with his only hand on the floor until he felt a slight bump. Trapdoor. There was another set of stairs leading further down. What the fuck is going on here? Donovan thought to himself as he descended downstairs. The basement was like a butcher's shop, but instead of meat, it was naked bodies left to freeze in the cold. Most of them, Donovan noticed, were women. Some appeared much younger in age, adding to Donovan's shock. In both disgust and horror, he froze, as on a bed, bound with ropes, was a young woman, probably no older than Kristen, who was apparently being violated by some person, or rather, what was left of a person, as he chanted certain chants while he assaulted her, his thick, curly hair slowly caressing his head as he shook the bed with his fury. His eyes were stitched shut, and she remained unmoving as the man went on and on. The man watched Donovan in shock and stood up, his face contorting into a mocking smile underneath his patchy and dirty beard. The woman on the bed twitched, showing signs of life as she did, apparently struggling helplessly, her body being violated and her mind lost. Donovan didn't have to think twice as he rushed at the man with all the strength he had in his right arm and sent the man down on the ground. His jawbone shattered as he hit the hard ground and he coughed up blood and a few teeth. He turned to look at Donovan, but it was too late for him. Donovan had his gun out and locked on his head, firing without thinking. A gasp behind Donovan startled him as a man walked out of another room next to this room, dressed in the cathedral's signature white robe, as Donovan fired another shot without another thought, staining the white robe with blots of red and brains. Where death is the light, rather than a shadow, where time is as cruel as pain and love leads to loss, is a land where the cold has taken over. Demons lurk in this land that was once home to the living, for God has looked away, and in his shadow, the unspeakable becomes the happening, where temples rise for the evil and sacrifices are made for the cruel. There still is hope. This hope dies when men become demons. Donovan's jacket shielded the bare young woman on the dingy mattress. She twitched, not knowing what else to do. All senses had been stolen from her. The only sensations she felt at the moment was the cold and roughness of the cloth she laid on. Donovan tried to free her from the thread that had so cruelly bound her lips together, but his hands were trembling very badly, and he was too afraid to hurt her even worse. He tried hushing her through his sobbing voice, hoping that her hearing still remained, and if it did, madness hadn't taken her away yet. It's okay. It's okay. He couldn't even get himself to say it. 
He never felt shaken like this before. All his anger buried under disgust and fear. So lost in his feelings, he did not even hear the heavy footsteps behind him, grabbing him from the back and tossing him onto the hard ground. Do you have any idea what the fuck did you just do? Said the large man, Boris. His hands gripped onto Donovan's throat. There was so much hatred in his eyes for Donovan, but Donovan knew that he was afraid too. The entourage had followed him, and Kane, in his wheelchair, was brought down with the aid of three other priests. Boris landed punch after punch onto Donovan's face until he was so bruised and battered his face swelled a sickening purple. Boris did not care if this man lived or not, he just wanted him dead. He picked up his foot to land a crushing stomp on Donovan's head before he finally heard Kane call out to him. Stop this right now. Mr. Boris, I will not have this anymore. You will leave the man and step back. Boris resisted the urge to land another hit and stepped back, still breathing heavy in rage. Running down the stairs, Mr. Rosen came up to Donovan's side and watched him, bloody and bruised on the ground, unmoving. He wanted to say something, but he was in a terrible shock himself. His jaw hung gaping at the sights of his companion on the ground, dying as he stood there, helpless. What? What the fuck did you do? All heads in the room turned to Mr. Rosen, even Ambers, who had been watching from the upright corner, not daring to descend down the stairs in fear of what she might find down there. She had spent so much time in her room in the past few days, alone and grieving, she did not have an idea of whatever was going on in here. She heard the terrible sounds coming from the middle of the room of groaning and struggling coughs and pieced something together that she did not like. Mr. Rosen had finally spoken out, and that too in a whimper. I'm terribly sorry for such a sight, Mr. Rosen. But you must understand what was going on in here. Hector said all this so calmly, it made a chill run up Amber's spine. Something was very wrong down here. Mr. Rosen began to take in the side of the room, naked bodies hanging around like a butcher's shop, two bodies on the ground, and Donovan struggling to move in his agony. On the bed, there lay a woman, twitching and shaking naked. But Mr. Rosen was not close enough to see what made her behave in such a manner. This might all seem terrible, Mr. Donovan, but I assure you, this was the only way to get our world back from the demons. Donovan crawled, slipping in his own puddle of blood. He couldn't hear anything other than the ringing in his ears from the pounding he took. And Hector, more or less, didn't care. Going on anyway. A ritual to please a lesser demon god. An offering, though cruel as it may seem, is the only way that she would be persuaded to shut the gates. We build a temple under a church for him to please her, and you, Mr. Donovan, you just... What the fuck do we do now? Boris asked Hector, visibly shaking with fear. There was the sound of slow and uneven steps, as of a drunk man walking on a plank to his death above them. Oh, fuck. The tattooed man murmured, standing next to Mr. Rosen. The heads looked up to the floorboards above and started moving towards the stairs, step by step. Amber realized that whatever all of these men feared was coming from the stairs ran down and away from the stairs, hoping that whatever was coming did not notice her hiding in plain dark. The red-haired girl walked slowly down the stairs, and then down into the ground beneath, sparing a tiny glance at Amber as she made her way, who was very confused at this point, simultaneously fearing for her life as well as Donovan's. Mr. Rosen stepped aside, not wanting to make any contact with the young, fiery-haired girl who now entered the room and stood beside Donovan's twitching body. She knelt down to him, and everyone watched in silence. 
a kiss from those red, tired lips on Donovan's head, and a gentle caress on his hair, made him find his way back to his feet, her hand gripping his. No need for apologies. All is not lost. She spoke out. Mr. Rosen had heard her for the first time. Her voice was soft as butter, and yet there was something cold about it. She looked at the still twitching girl on the bed, who had now slowed her motions, as she too could sense an air of tension around her. Smiling, the red-haired girl bent down to the bound woman and stripped herself out of her robe, slowly and calmly, revealing smooth and perfect skin. Even in such hellish conditions, except the large opening in her back, from which her spine protruded out and peeked into the world. This wasn't a girl. It was a vessel, clothing for something else. She put her hand gently over the bound woman's throat and proceeded to bite her throat, pulling her neck bone and flesh out while the struggles increased hitting around aimlessly as much as her bound limbs allowed her to, but to no avail. Her death was inevitable now. As she bled out to death, Mr. Rosen squatted on the ground and began to gag. The stress of it all had been too much for him to bear. Well, now, this skin has gotten a bit older. Maybe I should take it off for a while. The red-headed demon said, taking a moment to turn back and glance around at the fearful expressions of people present. Golda, we are... Hector was cut off. Oh, Hector, shut up for once. She smiled as she began to grasp at the skin from the back, most of the room averting their eyes away for what was to come. Mr. Rosen followed suit and decided that it was best to look away. Donovan's screams pierced through Mr. Rosen, as if it was the scream of his own child. Yet he did not look. His fear for his own sanity was far greater than his curiosity. Mr. Rosen felt a splash of something warm on his skin, running his hand against his cheek and inspecting the red, thick liquid he could only assume was blood. Ember had had enough and decided to make a run for it, climbing up the stairs and running far left. She needed someone to comfort her. All this was close to tearing her sanity apart. She flung the door open and broke down next to Julia, who clutched a frightened Jimmy in her arms, crying as well. Amber, what are those screams? Julia asked through terrified tears. Amber, for a response, just clutched her and buried her face into Julia's warm shoulders for comfort, crying like a little girl again as she did. Jimmy did not care about Amber's impressions of him, crying his fear out as well. Amber then came to a thought, a thought that made her anxiety much worse. Julia... Where's Mike? She asked, holding her sobs back. Oh fuck, oh fuck, oh fuck, God, please, please help me. Mike prayed, clutching the pistol with both hands, hiding beside the wall opposite to the basement entrance, beside the confessional. Donovan's screams itself were so terrible, he did not care about his eyes beginning to water like a child. He was not going to let himself die as a coward, though. That was a promise that he had made himself the day he had arrived here, and he intended to keep it. But hearing Donovan's agonizing screams made him seriously reconsider his plan. When the screams finally ended, Mr. Rosen waited quite a while, which felt like an eternity to him, before peeking back to see what had happened. Donovan had been lying on the ground. His body remained unmoved but his eyes had been stitched together with his own earlobes that had been stretched and used as a threat. He was covered in blood. It looked like he was a newborn babe amongst this filth. His bones appeared twisted and mangled, 
and he was lying apparently naked on the cold floor, with his genitalia mutilated grotesquely by the demon as well. Mr. Rosen was sure that he would lose his mind at this point, but he looked elsewhere. The demoness had been putting her old skin back on, and thankfully, he did not have a chance to look at what she looked like out of the skin. The tattooed man slowly walked close to Donovan's body on the demoness's command, who told him to then pick him up and place him on the bed. As the man reached down, a loud gunshot pierced through his skull and came out through the other side, splattering the contents of his brain onto Donovan's lifeless corpse. Mike then turns to Hector, who in a terrified trance tried to move out of his chair, but failed to do so. His brain was spread all over his chair and on the clothes of the men behind him. No one could interfere. Everyone felt as helpless and alone as the other man, and Mike, taking advantage of this, walked past the crowd and fired at the demoness. One shot, two, three shots, and then the final shot, all going right through her chest. To Mike's horror, she stood still, an excited expression on her face. The torture and suffering she brought down obviously gave her intense pleasure, and she was lost in her ecstasy of what she had just done to Donovan when Mike had stepped in, giving her another plaything. She walked slowly to Mike, and with a gentle motion made him lay on the ground, looking straight into the eyes of a terrified Mr. Rosen, as she slowly pushed her fingertips into the eyes of Mike, who now screamed with as much fear and pain, and then twisted his head around, killing him. Well, I have had my fun, but I do need another, another offering. Lust remains incomplete, and I hunger for it. She said those words very calmly and coldly, with a sneer. Mr. Rosen couldn't take it anymore, yet he could not bring himself to move. You, you son of a bitch, you knew about this. Mr. Rosen could tell the voice spoke to him, but whose was it? Looking around, he saw Donovan lying on the floor his mouth still open and unstitched by the evil in this room. Oh well, the demoness said, remembering Donovan was still alive. She smiled as she raised her palm in the air, three large claws emerging from her fingertips, intending to end Donovan's life. No, no, please don't kill him. I'll serve you. I'll help with whatever you need. Just please let him go. Mr. Rosen said out loud, his eyes fixated on Donovan. The demoness, still sneering, faced Donovan, who could tell that she faced him, even with his eyes shut. Go fuck yourself, Donovan murmured out. Mr. Rosen silently watched Donovan on the ground, still defiant to the very end just as the demon brought her claws down on him, piercing his skull, giving him a brutal end. Mr. Rosen fell to his knees, staring at Donovan's lifeless corpse as he began to cry. He cried, letting out all that he had held in. Kristen, Donovan, the attack at the station, everything. He had been so shocked by it all that he didn't even hear the sounds of crying and struggling as something was being dragged upstairs. Mr. Rosen gathered himself, although not very well, and watched as Boris carried Julia on his shoulders, who hit at the large man to no avail, and Amber, who was being dragged by her hair down the stairs and into the hell beneath. The demon ass stared at both of them, like a gluttonous child deciding his meal. I'll have both. You shall carry my child into this world. She pointed at Julia, still with that sneer on her face. You for my pleasure. She now pointed at Amber. Both women 
scared and sobbing. Mr. Rosen could not take it anymore and decided to act. He knew he would never forgive himself for this, but he ran. He ran out of the room and up the stairs. He did not turn back, knowing not if he was given chase, but the outside world could not be worse than this. He would rather get torn apart by whatever was outside than suffer the hell inside. He stumbled out, still crying and sobbing, running until his heart threatened to give out and his lungs were on the verge of collapse. He fell into the snow and screamed. He cared not if anyone would hear him now. He did want to die. He ran away like a coward from where the last people who he cared about were being torn to shreds. Nothing was left for him but the monsters to come get him. Or, if he was lucky, the cold. He did not know how far the church was, but he was sure he was far away. He could not tell through the fog, and he closed his eyes. He wanted to be oblivious to his executioner. Some steps in the distance. Something finally came to get him. The warm breath of whatever beast was next to him made him clench his eyes tight, accepting his end. Instead, feeling the snout of whatever it was inspecting his body by sniffing him. Scarlet, what you got there? The man said in the distance, running towards Mr. Rosen, lying in the snow. He was a younger man, but did not appear so. Heavily bearded, sporting a biker jacket, carrying a huge cleaver in one of his hands. He bent down to inspect Mr. Rosen. The German shepherd ran back to his owner as if to tell him to inspect Mr. Rosen. The man bent down to inspect Mr. Rosen. Holy shit, you're alive. Here, Ross said handing Mike three guns he carried with him, taking them out of their hiding place under his belt. All right, man, you gotta stay sharp now, all right? Stay sharp, Donovan's in on this as well. Mike replied to him, whispering in the silence of the windy, cold night spent in the room of the cathedral. I'm telling you, man, I'm, I'm kinda scared. All this pagan shit that's going on here, I don't really know if we should be messing with it. I almost got caught with these guns, man. These priests, they aren't messing around, man. Ross whispered in his boyish voice, his words being cancelled by the sounds of the wind from any overhearers out the door of Mike's room. We'll be alright. We'll wave our guns around when they least expect it, and boom, we'll be in on everything. And hey, if there's anything shady going on, we do have our guns, right? They're just humans like us. They're monsters are in the stable out there, so we're good. Donovan's screams had been piercing through Mike's soul while he hid behind the confessional, clutching one pistol to his chest, the other in his pocket. He had been cursing and praying at the same time before he finally made up his mind and rushed down the basement to investigate. Ross tried to hear anything that he could, even though he didn't want to. His eyes were moist with fearful tears. There were two gunshots, followed by a moment of silence. He knew this was Mike, even though he didn't see Mike enter, but he was sure of it. It was confirmed when he heard a scream and a sickening snap. He tucked his gun back into his dark, long coat and began to run, out of the cathedral and over the gates, out into the snow, crying as he did, not looking back. He was a coward, and he was willing to admit it. At least there was some bravery in that, to admit that you were a coward. But there was no one to confess to. No family, no friends, all dead or probably being killed in some twisted way. The only god left to confess to was probably oblivious to his screaming soul. Only the devil could hear him scream. This was hell for the coward and brave alike. He turned back to look one last time. He needed to look. The urge was just so strong. He needed to look. 
And after that one last peek at the cathedral, maybe that bullet in his revolver's chamber would serve one final purpose. I should have died out there. I shouldn't be alive. I deserve to die. Mr. Rosen sat, his head resting on his palms, a broken man. No, man, I don't think like that, said the younger man in response. He stood by a tiny shelf, grabbing a can of tomato soup from in there, and then proceeding to set up on the wooden table in the center of the tiny home. The dog waited patiently by his chair, her tail wagging and mouth drooling at the smell of tomato coming from the open can, waiting for her owner to drop some of it into a tiny metal bowl on the floor. It's a harsh world out there. You gotta do what you gotta do to survive. You're lucky I found you when I did. There was a trail of dragging footsteps in the snow. I suspect someone else was out there, but something took him. Didn't know it was you. But if you ask me, that's our cue to get out of this town, the man said, dropping a portion of the viscous liquid for the dog, who impatiently but happily accepted this treat and went on about its business. Oh, fuck it. And there's something far worse going on here. I suggest we start moving now. Mr. Rosen said. The man walked, clutching onto his blade, the dog obediently following its owner as they made their way through the snow. Mr. Rosen followed along, his coat swinging in the air. He looked around him, uncaring for his life, though feeling more observant than ever. He had considered himself a dead man, and only in death does a man find true appreciation for the world around him, hoping to take in as much before their departure. Hold on, Mr. Rosen said. The man stopped immediately. The dog also stopped on his cue. There. I have to see what's there. He continued, looking at the giant ice sculpture in the distance. No. No way, man. I came in here through that way. There's a giant swarm of those brain-dead zombie things over there. The man said. What's your name, son? Mr. Rosen asked. My name. My name's Jack, he said, a little baffled. This question came out of the blue. Well, Jack, my name's Harold. What'd you say you and, uh... Mr. Rosen gestured to the dog. Is she scarlet? Jack said, reaching down to pet the German shepherd's head. Let's say you and Scarlet wait around here for a while. I have to see what's there. If I'm not back, and let's give it an hour or so, feel free to leave without me, Mr. Rosen said with resolve. Jack parted his lips to speak, but Mr. Rosen spoke out. Please, I know, I know what you're thinking, but it's something I have to do, and I have a feeling that it'll be fine. Call it an older man's intuition, but trust me on this, okay? Jack just silently nodded with his eyes to the snow below. Good. See you both soon, he said as he made his way to the sculptures. Or I could just go around. It'll take an hour to do so anyway, so I guess see you on the other side, Jack said out loud to Mr. Rosen, who just nodded in return with a slight smile. Hey, Jack yelled at Mr. Rosen, who stopped to turn around and face him. Do you have any weapons? Jack asked, concerned. Mr. Rosen made a gesture. His fingers pointed as if a gun and shot blankly at Jack, slowly smiling, turning back and proceeding to walk away. Jack frowned and continued walking in another direction with Scarlet. Mr. Rosen watched the swarm of chatterers walk in a perfect circle around the titanic shrine made of ice, made with such precision and perfection it was hardly believable. Even the most skilled builders cannot perfect a building, yet this temple of ice was made with such inhuman precision it was almost maddening to grasp its flawlessness. Mr. Rosen, without turning his head around, continued walking down the entrance of the temple, the smell of chalk dust fresh in the air. The top of the temple had detailed carvings of what Mr. Rosen could only interpret as damnation. 
The circle parted perfectly as Mr. Rosen walked nearer to the wall of the Chatterers, providing him entrance. For some reason, they did not walk either toward him or try to attack him. They simply gave him a way to enter their deity's shrine. He walked right through them, his gut telling him to keep moving. Harold. He heard his name whispered in the air. The sex of the speaker was hard to be determined. It was too subtle, yet noticeable enough to interpret. Oh, sir. The voice told him, and like an obedient child following his mother's command, he complied. He walked right through the unguarded gates, the handsome gatekeeper, the Faust, nowhere in sight. The inside was unlike what he was expecting. Instead of strange altars and statues, it only consisted of one long hall, made of something that was definitely not ice, made of a hard and strong substance of red, lit by torches hanging on the walls, held on the wall by hands protruding from the wall. Human hands. He kept on moving, finding his will to get closer to the end grew weaker and weaker, until he stopped. He felt as if he had awoken from a trance. The sudden realization of where he currently stood was strong enough to induce a panic attack, but somehow he remained composed. He stood there, silently, observing the walls on either side, looking at them closely and inspecting them for what they were made of. Harold, the voice came again, but it was strong this time and loud, loud enough for him to locate the source. Come, it's okay, said a young girl, her age no more than six or seven, clad in a black shirt attached to a black top. Her hair was blonde and curly, flowing down her tiny shoulders, and its tips gently rested over her back. Though, this was no girl, but no human girl at least, and even though the fact that she had no face should have struck fear in Mr. Rosen... It did not. A long, brown trunk, like that of an elephant, except twisted, protruded from her entire face, just shy of her hairline and chin, covering the part where her ears, eyes, mouth, and nose should have been. Come, she said, her hand held forward for Mr. Rosen to grab onto. She escorted him into a room at the end of the hall, a large room which contained a throne in the middle, a throne so magnificent in design and so pearly white, it felt like a sin to corrupt it with mortal eyes. Next to the throne stood the Faust. He was dressed in the same handsome suit as he did, with the same perfect hair and skin from that unfortunate day at the station. The girl walked to the throne and took a seat. I am Janice, the mother, the one who rises amongst the five rulers. As you can see around you, this world is no longer yours. The little girl spoke, her trunk remaining dangling, unmoving. Her words originated from her, but Mr. Rosen couldn't tell how. I... Mr. Rosen didn't know what to say. Do you wish to bargain? She asked Mr. Rosen. I have nothing, and nothing left. Oh yes, you do. The thing all mortals possess, that the immortals do not. What do you think this temple is made of? She asked. Her tone was ambiguous. Snow, Mr. Rosen said, knowing his assumption was not correct. Flesh, that's what it's made of. The vessel that contains what lies inside. The most valuable thing a mortal owns. You mean my soul? Mr. Rosen knew exactly what she wanted from him at that moment. Yes, your soul. If you do choose to bargain here, in this place, you shall possess what you want, anything, and it's yours. Mr. Rosen was tempted to do so perhaps to ask for revenge, but something in his heart told him that it would be unwise to do so. It just did not feel right. If my soul is the only thing I have left, 
I choose to keep it, he said, his tone expressing shame. As you wish, but do know, you are safe as long as you are in this circle. Once you leave, my children will not hesitate to collect your flesh. After all, that is their purpose. She warned. Why are you telling me this? Mr. Rosen asked back. I love all my children equally, and you mortals are amongst them as well. And letting them get slaughtered is love? That's... that's pure evil. Mr. Rosen asked. He was angry, but too afraid to show it to her. Evil doesn't exist, dear child, she said calmly. Can you... can you help me? Mr. Rosen did not know why he asked, but it was worth the chance. A mother cannot favor a child. A child must earn. The commanders of the realm will provide you safe passage out. But further than that, I mustn't interfere. Mr. Rosen turns to leave, but before he could, Janice spoke out one last time. A mother's door is always open for her child. Julius screamed and cried, trying to flee the room. The red-haired demon had caught hold of her and kept laughing, her screams followed by loud thumps and low growls. Ember buried her head into her thighs, wrapping her arms around her as she sat above the floor. Her fear had exhausted her tears, and now she felt completely numb. What was to happen would happen. She was afraid to say no to the demon. She knew what had happened to Donovan and Mike. Their bodies hung together, naked, inside a circle painted with their own blood. Their bodies were stretched by nails and string, tied together to form a pentagram. She heard the demon growl from beneath, and Julia screamed, before it was followed by a loud smack, and Julia started weeping. You do know what I would do to the boy if he did not comply, right? Would you like him to take your place instead? The demon asked calmly, a sickening excitement in its voice. Amber was sickened by this thought, her fear now slowly breaking her mind, reaping the sanity out of it. The demon must have sensed her fear, because it called out to her from beneath, and she knew she knew what would happen, but she chose not to move, instead sitting quietly. She wanted to die. She would be killed by the thing if she didn't move. She hoped for it, but it slowly stumbled up to her, in the form she did not want to look at again. The contorted bodysuit made by the skin of a real person. It grabbed her hair and slowly dragged her down to the basement, kicking and screaming. She knew that her torture would carry on for long. She knew what she would have to face. But the worst thought of all was that this may never, ever end, and that she was all alone. Mr. Rosen woke up, glancing next to him, the pistol sitting invitingly on the desk next to his bed in the empty hotel. Was today the day? He lifted the pistol to his head and placed his finger on the trigger. There was no will to pull it. With his eyes clenched tight, he believed he would do it any moment, but he couldn't bring himself to do so. He sat down on the wooden chair of the empty, fancy hotel, his joints hurting. His hair had grown whiter over the month. Even though it hadn't been long, he felt like an old man already. Jack sat down across from him and helped himself to some old bread, serving half of it to Mr. Rosen. Scarlet sat beside him on the floor, her head resting down. Her stomach now had bones protruding from them. She was weak, and so were her unselfish human companions, who did feed her her share as well. One of these days, I know I'm gonna do it. I don't know when. I know that I'll wake up someday, and I'll have the will, Mr. Rosen said to Jack, holding a tiny pistol in his hand. Too bad there's only one bullet left. I feel really bad. 
The Scarlet's been getting weaker. I don't know how long we'll have stuff to scavenge. All this cold. Nothing will grow here either. Jack replied, tearing a piece of the dry bread. Yeah. Well, too bad there's just one bullet. Mr. Rosen said, suddenly starting to laugh a little. It was so funny. Jack asked. It'll be the first time I'll actually use a gun. Mr. Rosen said. Oh, Kristen. You weren't here to complete this lesson. Maybe I'll have to teach this one to myself. I don't know what to do anymore. He said again. Then pausing to eat his piece. Then shedding a tear. Jack kept placing his arm on Mr. Rosen's shoulder. There was some silence for a while, before there were some sounds outside. The door was opened. Mr. Rosen stood up, and Jack did too. He gestured to Mr. Rosen to stay put. He needed to see who these people were first, so he walked to the entrance, while Mr. Rosen went to hide in the bathroom, pressing his ear to the wall. The door opened. Oh my god, you're, you're, you're human, Jack said with his boorish excitement. Yeah, well, how are you holding up in here? The visitor said. Uh, pretty bad, well. Jack replied. Nice dog, what's the name? Another voice spoke. Uh, oh, uh, she's Scarlet. One of the two visitors bent down to pet Scarlet from what Mr. Rosen could hear. Listen, uh, we've been tracking your movements for a while, and now that we've found you, you gotta come with us. We have a large group a little far from here. We have enough food and supplies to take care of you. You can bring the dog along. Said a man who, judging from the voices, stood in front of Jack while his partner petted Scarlet. Mr. Rosen, on hearing this, walked out of the door excitedly. Oh, uh, thanks. Uh, he abruptly was cut short by the horror of the realization. These two men wore white robes. Things were still for a moment. A moment that felt like eternity. Maybe multiple eternities. Mr. Rosen felt his heart jump to his throat, and before he knew it, he had raised his pistol and fired at the man standing ahead of Jack. A crack could be heard in the air as the gun was now vacant of its last bullet, which now resided in the priest's skull, entering through his nose. The other man stood up to attack, but Scarlet bit around his leg, stunning him. He tried to push her off, but she was stubborn, so he pulled out a knife and cut at her left eye, making her lose her grip on him and whimper in pain. Mr. Rosen grabbed onto the man and tried to take control of his knife, which was difficult to do. The man was much stronger than him, so he resided to do what he knew would work, and bit his throat, pulling away and tearing a string. The man tried to grasp his throat and struggled, but fell on the ground instead, his life leaving him. Mr. Rosen felt a sweet release. All of this violence made him feel liberated and free at last. He proceeded to stomp the dying man's head into a pulp. Jack was shook by the horror that unfolded here. Well, I know what to do now, Mr. Rosen said. The skinned horse ran up to the cathedral, carrying something on its back as it strode forward. Boris had noticed this from a distance and proceeded to stop the horse and unload it. His eyes grew wide in shock as he noticed what it carried. Amber stood beside Julia, holding her hand, her belly swollen, her eyes darkened. She had not been abused as much as poor Julia. Her mind was obviously lost at this point, yet she seemed content today. The naked bodies of the two priests lay on the floor. The demon amused with this act somewhat, and turning to Boris, smiling, but turned his gaze away when he heard laughing. Julia had been having another laughing fit, this time more insane than usual, laughing louder and louder. 
You, she said, between laughs. You guys are fucked. You know what's weird, Mr. Rosen? Kristen said, poking a stick at the fire in the middle of the bank they had been sheltered in. Mr. Rosen shrugged in response. I always thought that the world would end in fire, and not this damn blizzard, Kristen said, her eyes reflecting the red flames. Fire. Maybe it will. The world hadn't ended quite yet. But for now, this fire is the only thing keeping us from freezing to death. Mr. Rosen said with a smile. I would much rather burn to death, Mr. Rosen, rather than... You know, Kristen said, obviously unsettled, thinking about the danger that lurked outside. Pure, clean, and not bloody, Kristen finished. I wouldn't let you die, Kristen. You're the only family I got, he said, offering her a fatherly smile to comfort her. Kristen pretended to be calmer, but inside, her heart was slowly choking on the fear of what lay outside. Hello? Yeah, this is Harry. How you doing, Ma? Mr. Rosen held up the remains of the payphone up to his ear, exhaling a mist out of his lungs in the coat, and barely noticing it picking at his face, unprotected by the heavy beard. I just want to say, I'll be coming to visit. I'm sure that heaven won't open its gates for me, but I'll try, Ma. I'll try. With that, Mr. Rosen put the phone down and coughed. Are you ready? A deep and raspier voice asked, standing next to the ice wall of the unholy temple. The man who built it withstood the cold running around him. His eyes blank as ever, standing cross-armed next to his creation while Mr. Rosen put down the remains of the payphone hanging the line. Yeah, Mr. Rosen said with fiery eyes. I'm ready. The walk back was exhausting, but he didn't have a choice. He, unlike the priestess, did not have one of those skinned animal demons to ride, and not like there was any road that was cleared for him to ride any vehicle. I love you, bro, Jack said, his arms wrapped around Mr. Rosen, who did the same, patting on Jack's back. Be safe, son, Mr. Rosen said as he let Jack go, leaning down to pet the German shepherd who had now had her ribs pressed against her skin and fur, yet not losing her enthusiasm, and excitedly wagged her tail as Mr. Rosen rubbed her head. There were no goodbyes, but just a subtle nod shared between the two men as they parted ways. This was it. This was either going to be the final chapter of his life, or perhaps the best one yet. This is the only remarkable thing he would ever do. Teaching high school kids would have been what he would have done for the rest of his life, but that is not what the universe had apparently had in mind. By the time the demon was done, Amber had felt nothing. She had resisted its sadistic ways at first, but now all of those had seemed so futile. She knew that it would go on for eternity even though the idea scared her. But that was the rest of her life. She would wake up, chained up like an animal, endure. And maybe, if the world was in a worser one of its moods, the beating. And then, set out to be used by the demon's followers, who, thankfully, just shot her pitying glances and gave her space as she bled and cried herself to exhaustion. And repeat the cycle. She felt particularly bad for Julia. The woman had lost her sanity. Her mind had hit back into her childhood years, feeling unsafe in this world. The place she slept in was warm, yet it reeked of urine and feces. The demon had no remorse and no feelings of disgust. 
This is what hell was. Nothing could be worse. She had often tried to escape from the chain, but her neck was bound too tight for her to run or pull her way out. She was doomed, unable to even kill herself, for there was no way to do so. Her death would come, for sure, but it would be harsh. At this point, she would rather be burned alive. All that blood she was used to seeing reminded her of the red jam her mother used to make back home. The seeds floating in the coagulated jelly and the sweet aroma seemed to bring her away from this torture, yet the cold chains reined her back in. With that, and the sudden awareness of being barefoot on the cold, hard floor under the basement, she let out another cry, this time pushing her throat to its limits, hoping to cough up blood and die. This is it, Rosen. End of the line for you. Mr. Rosen thought to himself as he reached the cathedral front gate. After all of these months, the gate still made him shudder with fear. The two skeletons, which he only could assume to be were of Donovan and maybe Ross or Mike, would have intimidated him earlier, but now it only seemed to strengthen his resolve. I've come for you, he said to himself, a final moment of hesitation leaving him as he made his first step to the cathedral. The skin on the demon had almost rotted down to a maddening sight. The skin of the young woman it wore, now crawling with worms inside and out, making it rancid. It knew that it needed new skin, and after Julia had birthed its child, that is exactly what it intended to do with her corpse. Her screams were audible across the hall, and it couldn't feel any more pleasurable. Chills of lust went down the demon's spine as she screamed one final time, and then stopped. The door opened, and young Jimmy walked out with a bloody blade. He was covered in his mother's blood, a look of absolute resolve on his face. I did it, mother. I birthed your child from the human. He said to the demon with a cold and unfeeling stare. You did well, child, the demon said, its hands ruffling the boy's hair, making the boy smile with a feeling of achievement. The demon wanted nothing more than to gut the boy here, to violate him, to do unspeakable and horrible things to him while his dying mother watched, yet it kept its restraint. On the day of birthing, he was not to touch another. Ignoring its body's lustful calls, it entered the birthing room to have a look at the woman who birthed its child. After a few hours, it would consume the shell it was born in and consume the mother, Julia, who lay bleeding to death, unable to even scream from the pain of her ripped abdomen and the horror of her own blood mutilating her. Mom! Jim screamed out in a sudden realization, storming into the room to get his dying mother. The demon groaned and sighed as it held Jimmy and whispered into his ear, sending him into a trance. He only snapped back into reality every few weeks or so, but this was two weeks in a row that it has happened. It heard a few men walking up behind, and with a thud, it heard a body drop onto the ground. It sniffed the air and smirked. Rosen, boy, you truly have been maddened, have you not? It turned back to look at Rosen, and then stepped back to extract the child from the mother's open belly, who twitched when it reached in to pick it up. You are just in time, my infant child. It raised it up in the air and inspected it. Ah, well, it does have, uh, like you human men, well, 
It is a boy, it said in its deep and mocking voice. The child resembled a human child in all aspects. There was no distinguishable difference between it and a human-born child, other than the complete lack of cries. I'll leave this one right here, it said, placing it back down into a dying Julia's body. The tall priest picked up Rosen and up by the collar. Let's get this over with, shall we? Rosen spat at the floor. Jimmy slowly stood up, as if from a restful night. Oh, Jimmy, this is a bad man who tried to kill Mother. What would you do? The demon spoke with indifference. Rip his eyeballs out, Jimmy said in a rehearsed speech. Jesus Christ, Jimmy, Mr. Rosen said. He bit his lip, anticipating something, but there were no sounds. Jimmy got an approving nod from the demon as he headed towards Rosen, reaching into his pocket for a tiny blade. Mr. Rosen cringed at the idea, now restless with anticipation and fear. God damn it, where the hell are you? He mumbled as Jimmy held Mr. Rosen's face. The tall priest averted his gaze in disgust. Jimmy was about to thrust the knife in, but Mr. Rosen retaliated by headbutting him, breaking his nose and sending him back. The demon let out a cackle and poked at Jimmy with its feet, who rolled around, crying like the little boy he was. Well, Rosen, that was fun, but you... An explosion cut it short. It wasn't large or dangerous by any means, but rather too loud for comfort. The demon smirked at this attempted defiance and pulled Mr. Rosen up. Take your men and see what happened out there. The demon spat. The priest nodded and charged out the room, yelling around to the other priests. Well, Rosen, it's just you and me then. Wanna play a little? Outside, the men of the cathedral slowly opened the door to investigate. The robes didn't protect them from the cold, but rather the demon's spell did, which left them with clothing that wasn't too heavy for combat, which was the only idea that comforted this troop. For others, the fear of death wasn't as great as the fear of consequences that would follow disobedience or desertion. Boris headed the troops, holding a large blade, the unwilling army of Hell's mortal army. There was a burning mess ahead, consisting of metal and gasoline, a smell that had been so ancient in these times. All the fire that protruded was using alcohol, but the smell of gasoline was too strong. It had been so long. He was about to open his mouth to speak, but he felt a tremble, and to his horror, he realized that his feet were in the process of sinking into the snow below, like a quicksand. His comrades and fellow soldiers were equally horrified as the white terrain began to swallow them. The last thing Boris saw before being completely immersed was a man dressed in a biker jacket, layered with a thick brown coat, carrying a spear with him. Boris opened his mouth to yell, but the snow gagged him as it entered his mouth, intent on being swallowed. It was as if the snow was sentient, as if it had a life of its own. Scarlet ran up to the sinking man, reaching him before Jack could, growling furiously at the man, at the same time wagging her tail in excitement. Jack immersed the spear into the ground, and then withdrawing it with some force, pulling out a chunk of flesh as he did, and sprayed blood onto the snow, which Scarlet started to lick up as she wagged her tail, then worked on the flesh that Jack removed from the makeshift spear made out of a pipe and a sharp but rusty hook. He then walked over to another side, and while cringing, did the same, pulling out his spear from the red spot he left in the snow. The ground slightly trembled again, and he stepped back. Scarlet hurried up to him, frightened. 
Something emerged from the ground. A tree-like figure, yet leafless, but with a thousand arm-like branches glowing from inside, as if a fire danced within. Jack circled the tree to get a good look. He felt a dull vibration in its vicinity, but it did not unsettle him. Rather, it intrigued him. But as interested as he was, he knew he had to step back. Scarlet wouldn't need to be asked to retreat. She was nervous about that tree, and her growls turned into whimpers as she got close to it. A fierce canine, now only a whimpering, shivering little creature who just wanted to hide in her owner's shadow. Ah, oh, shit, Jack said when he turned around to see what that large mass of bark had attracted. The arrival of the Chatterers was his cue to leave. These Chatterers were not insistent on circling the cathedral like the ones at the Ice Temple. Rather, they were closing in, forming a tight circle formation as they held hands and chattered. Some of them had lost skin on their faces, giving them grotesque, corpse-like features. But unlike corpses, they had a subtle, lifelike quality to them. A certain force that the dead didn't seem to possess. Never mind. Jack had to leave with Scarlet before escape became impossible, and the tightening circle of the damned consumed them as well. The demon could sense it. The betrayal of the higher order of its kind as the tree hummed louder and louder. It felt in itself a feeling that it had never felt before. A feeling that was other than sexual depravity and pleasure. A feeling of pure dread. An instinctual fear of life in all its apparent eternity coming to an end. Death came for men and demons alike unbiased and inevitable, yet it never anticipated its own death to ever come. Mr. Rosen smiled a bloody smile. The demon knew what it meant. You soul, you know what selling your soul means, don't you? It said. It means I take you the fuck out, Mr. Rosen said unaware yet uncaring that these would indeed be his last words before the chatterers stormed the gates of the cathedral. The priest soldiers resisted only to be torn apart, ripped to shreds by an indifferent force of hatred and pure, insatiable hunger. Mr. Rosen laughed as he watched the demonic force rip through the room, their hunger burning for the demon within reaching for it, but failing as it fought them off desperately by tearing at them, pulling their limbs apart, but eventually being overruled by a far greater force as they dragged at it, kicking and screaming, carrying its broken body apart. He felt the chatterers claw at him as well, ripping him away from their way as they crowded the demon, a feast of sinful flesh and blood. A fair trade, a soul for a life. Perhaps the best trade Mr. Rosen had made in his life. And now, at least if he was to die, it would be significant in some way, as all heroes' deaths are. He didn't care who the Chatterers carried off, but all he knew was that he had his revenge, and it satisfied him. The Chatterers had stormed out with their prey, carrying it to some dark fate. The last of them were still feasting on the remains of the priests that were left around, but they had no business with Harold Rosen. He felt his life leave his body slowly, and his knees now barely felt like doing anything other than shaking. If this was death, he would embrace it with open arms. But there was one final thing left to do. It took a while, but he was glad that he found it, and he knew exactly what he had to do with it. All that was left was to reach in time. He had felt his teeth chattering already, slowly overpowering his will to stay still. He feared that he would bite his own tongue off, 
But before that, he had to give it to someone. Someone who, unlike him, unlike Donovan, unlike Mike, did not deserve her fate. If only he could keep moving for a few more minutes. If only he could stand that one last step down the stairs. If only that fall was just at the right place, dropping that knife to a tied-up amber. If only he could know. But the dark had started to take him now, and his teeth were grinding against themselves already. He felt some warmth around himself, and felt a shadow pass over. Hell wasn't cold, after all. <laughs>